It is main event time here in Newcastle, starting with the 206 Stars class. On pole, we have Hunter Perry. Alongside of him is Adam Maxwell. You can see them giving a fist bump, getting ready to start this race. Uh, it's been an exciting class to watch so far this weekend. Lots of action, uh, lots of close racing, and uh, a few incidents have happened, I, I, I'd like to say. Uh, what do you think, Emery? Yeah, I mean, it's been really fun to watch. Adam Maxwell in the pre-final had a really good run. Obviously fell about two and a half seconds back from Hunter Perry. He was able to make it up really quickly. He led a whole group of them up to Perry. And then it ended up being just the two of Maxwell and Perry. Have a couple of really fast cars starting a bit deep in the field. Mick Gabriel has had issues all weekend. He's been really fast when he's been clean. And you have Ryan Kastner as well starting deep in the field. He had issues in the pre-final. As we're getting ready, and we're green. And here we go, coming down into turn one, into I-70. It looks like Maxwell's held well on the outside. But I think that's going to be Hunter Perry into the race lead coming out of turn one. You can see Perry able to take the lead of the race. And as they're coming around, you can really see just everyone stacking up now. So this is Perry from Maxwell. It looks like that might be the one, 126 of Brendan Johnson, possibly in P3, maybe. I don't know. But at the same time, you could, we'll get a number on that pretty soon. But in the meantime, Perry and Maxwell working together, as we saw all the time in the pre-final. Maxwell takes a peek on the outside of the scoreboard. We'll see if he's going to make the move coming into the green corner. He does not. He sticks right on the bumper of the back of Hunter Perry. Now, those two are going to continue to work together down into the kink and through coming towards Cell Tower now as the top five have sort of gotten a little bit of a breakaway now from the rest of the field now. As we head towards Cell Tower now, Hunter Perry continues to lead, get a little bit of a gap from Maxwell, but basically it is a line full of the entire field. You can see Mick Gabriel looks like he's made up a couple of places on this opening lap. You can see... Coming further back down the field, you've got a lot of guys that are right there together and potentially making moves. It's been a little bit of a poor start from James Brazel in the 113 cart. He looks, looks to have fallen back just a little bit. I believe that cart that is into P3 is Grant Pendry in the 112 who started the race from fourth position. And then you can see just a whole line of cars. I believe that's Brendan Johnson that's worked his way up into fourth place. And then beyond that, you've got Derek Sokol as well as up there. And you've got Mick Abrils all the way up into seventh now from 10th on the grid. So now the completing lap one looks like Perry and Maxwell content to just work with each other and continue to push. But behind him, it looks like Braden Johnson was able to work himself up into P3 at the end of the lap. Yeah, it's been an exciting first lap here. Everyone is staying relatively close together as the front two uh, began to, to start making a few mistakes. You see Hunter Perry kind of just ran wide right there. So Adam Maxwell is looking for a move on the inside, but he's going to have to wait a little bit before he can. He keeps getting runs off these corners. Uh, if he keeps going like this, he's going to be able to get to the lead here shortly. Uh, Adam Maxwell is still, though, falling closely behind Hunter Perry. And that looks like Grant Pendry. Uh, down to fourth. It looks like Braden Johnson has made the move up into third right behind his teammate, uh, Adam Maxwell. Adam Maxwell is going to go to the inside, and he's through for the lead. Adam Maxwell took the lead on lap two here in the uh, 206 Stars division. Mick Gabriel all the way up into fourth now as he made a pass coming through the cell tower wall of Maxwell taking the lead, and that is a really good start for Gabriel. You have to think, if he can keep that cart clean over the course of the race and can continue making these moves, it's only a matter of time because he has had the raw pace all weekend to be arguably the fastest cart in the category alongside with Adam Maxwell. And it's just he just has to put things together here in the final. Maxwell now coming across to complete another lap. Lap number two of this race, he's now in the lead. We'll see if Perry works with him like Maxwell is willing to work with under Perry. Braden Johnson is in P3, sticking on. He's had a bit of a rough weekend so far. Had a lot of pace, though. Now Gabriel will take a peek to the inside of Johnson, sticks in the fourth. I mean, Mick Gabriel's cart has been so fast. And if you look at the times, he's already doing a 23-3. That's about six tenths quicker than Maxwell. Notably, it's quicker than pretty much anything we saw from most of the race outside of Mick Gabriel himself in the pre-final. I mean, Gabriel has been just so fast, and you can see now, going to make a late move on Johnson. Johnson tries to shut the door. They're going to be side-by-side -side coming out of score, but it looks like Johnson maintains the position. That's going to bottle Gabriel up. Is he going to be vulnerable into the green corner? Not quite. It looks like he's going to stick in fourth, but that gave a little bit of a gap to Perry and Maxwell in the top two but certainly a good start to the race for Mick Gabriel. He's going to make another little peek to the inside coming through the kink, and he's just really antsy to get by Brandon Johnson. He's going to do it in the cell tower. No mercy there, just absolutely forces the issue, gets the job done now through the double left, and he's got the position cleared with a little bit of a gap to the front too, but certainly with Maxwell and Perry working together, they're going to have to to be able to keep Gabriel at bay. Yeah, Gabriel's been really fast to start this race. He's already up into the third position after starting back outside the top 10 or in 10th position. He's up into third now, uh, coming through the last few corners here to complete lap number three. He's already passed seven carts in the first two laps of the race. Super impressive from Gabriel, and you can see he's tucking. He's 
getting excited and he's antsy to get up to those leaders and you know he's going to be there real quick with the pace that he has uh, except for the fact that Maxwell just went um, or Keegan Clark back in eighth Keegan Clark qualified on pole earlier this weekend and has been one of the fastest carts on track but has had some issues he just went purple back in eighth place with a 22.8 he's the only driver in the 22 second bracket so he's going to be one to watch for and he's already up into sixth after being eighth the last time we crossed the stripe. So super impressive from uh, Keegan Clark back in sixth as he goes to the red 171 hairpin right there. Uh, but Mike Gabriel is already up to the bumper of that looks like Hunter Perry in second place. So it looks like Mick Gabriel is the fastest cart of the three up front. So he'll, he'll be making moves here shortly. I mean, you look at the amount of aggressiveness Gabriel has throughout this lap. I believe he got a point at black earlier in the early in the race, but certainly he's got a lot of speed in that car. As he pushes Hunter Perry by on Adam Maxwell for P1. Maxwell's under threat from Gabriel into the double left, but Gabriel wisely backs out of that, did not want to try to pull John Antonino and go around the outside of the double left. A little bit too early in the race for that, but now Hunter Perry resumes the lead of the race. Now we'll see what Maxwell does. Now he knows that Mick Gabriel is on his bumper. Will that influence his decision making? I mean, Gabriel has been just slicing through this field all the way through this final so far, and as we see now Hunter Perry coming across coming around the final corner to pick up another lap led throughout this weekend. It's been a good weekend for all three of your top three, but certainly at the moment, it looks like Gabriel is going to be a little bit more patient maybe, but coming into turn one, you have to think Maxwell's going to go for it, and he does into the cell tower. Adam Maxwell to the lead. Is Gabriel going to follow him through? He's going to push He's going to pu push Hunter Perry a little bit wide on exit, but certainly a lot, of, a lot of respect given there. Now Gabriel, you have to think, he might not be content to work with Maxwell. Maxwell's got to know that Gabriel's gone from 10th on the grid now to being second through only four laps of this race. And as they come into the scoreboard, Linus Stern through the top five, about a six-cart group now all the way back to Keegan Clark, who has continued to chip away at this, and he is really fast. He's running times that are comparable to only McGabriel. He's the only guy that has that kind of raw speed in this cart so far, and he has been absolutely flying so far. He's joining the back of that group. He's going to have to get through five guys in breaks, which is not easy to do. I mean, this is one of the harder classes to pass in, but certainly, I mean, we've seen with Mick Gabriel, anything's possible, and Keegan Clark is following him through. Yeah, Mick Gabriel already up into the second position here as the top six really start to close in on each other. Uh, you could throw a blanket over all six of them, uh, so this is going to turn into a really exciting race as we have just about seven minutes left before we get the two-to-go signal. This time is winding down, and Mick Gabriel and Adam Maxwell know it. That's why they're trying to push away and try to make this a two-man fight, but Hunter Perry is not letting that happen as the whole field comes through the last few corners. And Keegan Clark is just on the edge of that five-card train for the lead. I think he made a mistake right there because he was right there. But hopefully there's a little bit of battling here, and he'll be able to kept, catch back up to them. But as, as we watch the two leaders, they're just pushing. Adam Maxwell is just not getting passed by Mick Gabriel. Mick Gabriel's being smart, trying to get away from the rest of the field as that is working. Braden Johnson into P2, he just went, or P3, he just went purple last time by. He's the fastest go-kart on the track, about three tenths faster than your leaders. So he's one to watch as he is in third place now with Hunter Perry tucked in behind him and Matthew Darlison right there in behind him. You have to wonder if maybe the group has kind of signaled out Hunter Perry being a little bit of the weak link. You've seen Everyone else being willing to work with each other. And on Perry's case, he's just not been able to keep up with that pace. And you saw Braden Johnson got a little bit impatient, decided to make a move. We saw Mick Gabriel had to make the move into P2. And we saw Adam Maxwell as well, did not want to sit behind Perry for too long. So at the moment, your pole sitter looks like he might be a little bit behind on the pace. Certainly still quick enough to keep up with the group, but maybe not to lead. But Maxwell just doing a nice job of keeping Gabriel at bay. And also, Gabriel has a lot to do with this, just continuing to try to push away at the moment. Braden Johnson's running a time. He just went purple last time, so he's been running quicker than what Maxwell and Gabriel have been able to do. But at the end of the day, like if those two can work together and everyone else fights behind them, it could may mean that it's too far out for anyone to fight the top two. But Gabriel, we'll see what he does if he continues to be patient with Maxwell or if he decides to make a move pretty soon. Yeah, as you can see, Mick Gabriel just went purple. Him and Maxwell are the fastest go-karts on the track, and you can see them pulling away from Braden Johnson behind him. Braden Johnson needs to put his head down and try and run those two down, because if not, those two are going to drive away and make it a two-man battle. Uh, we have about five minutes and 30 seconds left to go in this race. We're six laps in, so we'll see if they're able to keep spreading out the, the, the front two. And um, these, these two guys are really fast right now. Adam Maxwell getting pushed by Mick Gabriel. That's a pretty good combination we got right there. Keegan Clark, meanwhile, in sixth place, getting dropped by the front five. And the three, three, four, five, three, four, thir third, fourth, and fifth are currently getting gapped by Mick Gabriel and Adam Maxwell. So super interesting stuff going on right now. Um, it's turning into an awfully, awfully interesting race uh, trying to run down these leaders. Yeah, I mean, Mick Gabriel content to just st stand right behind 
Adam Maxwell at the moment. Maxwell's done a nice job of pacing it. He's doing a 122 for nobody else is quicker. As long as those two are continuing to build a gap, I don't think that Gabriel is going to have the need to force the issue. But at the moment, Braden Johnson looks like he's doing a better job of leading that group and is not losing too much time to the front two. But certainly, I mean, them dropping Keegan Clark is a sort of point as to how fast they've been in this race. I mean, mid-122s in this class is pretty good, especially considering what we saw in the heat races and what we saw as pole time. So these guys are absolutely flying at the moment. Obviously, Maxwell and Gabriel reset fastest lap. Maxwell, by a couple thousands, got him on this time. But certainly, those two really working together well, really continuing to stress their gap over the rest of the field. And, I mean, Adam Maxwell, he's been leading for a good portion of this weekend. He's been in control. And so it's nice to see him just continue to not make any mistakes because at the end of the day, like he's got a little bit of an experience deficit to McAvery, who's been around here for a while now. And so to have that sort of deficit and still be able to lead a race comfortably and continue and get all this experience leading. Oh, McGabriel really good. just hung a tire on the exit of the red 171 hairpin. That hurt him a little bit, but I'm guessing with the draft, he'll be able to come right back into this race. But Adam Maxwell, yeah, you like you said, he's very consistent. Last lap, he did a 444. A 122, 444, and this lap he just did a 122, 435. So he's within 10 thousandths of a second of his last time, and on a minute and a half track almost, that is super impressive from him. So we'll see if he can continue to to keep that keep that consistency going within within him and Mick Gabriel. Yeah, I mean Gabriel being Gabriel continuing to push him is a lot to do with that because if they weren't working together, I feel like they might not be quite as quick as the three behind them who are also trying to work together. But certainly. I mean, this has been a fa phenomenal job by Adam Maxwell, and a phenomenal job by Mick Gabriel as well to get from 10th to 2nd on the grid. Certainly, though, it's about to kick off. You've got about three minutes left on the clock. That would equate to roughly four or five laps to go in this race. So certainly, time is starting to tick a little bit. You can see Gabriel continuing to be consistent, continuing to be patient with Maxwell. But at some point, it's going to be time to get a trophy. It's going to be time to win this race, and one of them is going to have to finish, settle for second or even worse. So some point you will see them try to swap positions. But at the moment, I think Gabriel is just going to play this out as long as he possibly can and try not to risk anyone in that second group getting up to him. Yeah, I would guess Gabriel is going to wait until at least two to go before he makes his move on Adam Maxwell because he knows that he is pulling away from Braden Johnson, Hunter Perry, and Matthew Darlson back in third, fourth, and fifth as they are going through the green corner. Max or no, Adam Maxwell and Mick Gabriel still pushing. They push after every single corner, and when these 206 carts, uh, they are low horsepower, so every little bit of momentum you can gain is worth a lot of time around this long Newcastle Motorsports Park track. So these two drivers doing really well working together, and uh, we've seen a lot of this this weekend about two drivers pulling away from the rest of the field, and it's working for them right now. And uh, Matthew Darlison's it's starting to get dropped a little bit from third and fourth, which is kind of going to hurt them because that's one less driver to help push those two up into the rest of the up to the leaders yeah and also one of the things that also does it is it allows hunter perry to kind of just focus more on pushing Braden johnson not having to worry about potential contact from behind or potential passing opportunities and so in his case i think that johnson's doing a really good job of running the pace but the moment gabriel and maxwell are just simply too fast they both did a 122 162 equal lap times on the last time around Braden johnson and perry were about a tenth and a half off almost two tenths off so certainly i mean Gabriel's strategy is pretty clear. Push Maxwell out to the lead, make sure it's a two-cart race, and then we'll see what happens the last couple of laps. But certainly Gabriel's positioned himself well. He knows that those two have the fastest carts. He knows that any given moment he can make a move on Maxwell, and so Maxwell's going to have to stay ready for it. So certainly, I mean, this is a really good chess match that's about to take place between Adam Maxwell and Mick Gabriel as they've made it just a two-cart race. And then even for the podium spot, you see a similar sort of formation with Hunter Perry and Braden Johnson as those two don't quite seem to have the pace to keep up with the top two, but certainly are going to make a race for themselves for third and fourth. Yeah, definitely interesting for sure, Emery. Um, we're heading through the cell tower corner now. The two leaders starting to continue to spread out the, the, the gap from third and uh, second. So we're going to continue to watch this race as this time by, we are going to get the three to go. So two more laps after this one. So it's going to be... Uh, Time's winding down, and Mick Gabriel is going to start to get impatient here shortly, and he's going to get anxious and want to go that lead. So I'm um, excited to see when Mick Gabriel is going to make this move. It's a big strategy call, especially with these low-horsepower carts. Um, you, you never know. You can always have a drag race to the line. There's a lot of stuff that can happen when you have uh, all this momentum. Yeah, I mean, it certainly looks like Gabriel has a really good card in the backside of the track. I mean, it seems like he rotates just so well. But at the moment, it's like... At the, at the moment, because he's in P2 and he doesn't have the track position game, Maxwell can afford to go defensive at any place and kind of play into the group behind him's hands. And so, like, Maxwell might use that as a little bit of leverage to 
to allow him to have that defensive ability because at the moment Gabriel is just so focused on waiting and trying to make it a two horse race and he knows he has the cart to do it but at the same time Maxwell is going to be defending as soon as they get to two to go I would imagine because you don't want to risk losing the lead on a pass and then not get a chance to get it back with Gabriel and with someone especially with someone that's already moved his way all the way up through the field like Gabriel has you don't know when what he's experienced what sort of notes he's taken while he's been making those moves and where he's figured out maybe a little bit of a place to pass that's unconventional so Certainly would expect Maxwell to be defensive pretty soon here, but also at the same time, Gabriel has been really patient all the way through, and so far it's paid off. I mean, they've made it a two-cart race when it really wasn't. It looked like it was going to be a five- or six-cart race at the beginning, and it's just evolved into the two fastest carts on the track that we've seen all weekend running up front are going to fight it out for the win over these last two laps. As now, Mick Gabriel chooses to goes. make his moves. Well, coming to the two to go, coming into the last few corners, he's now going to take the lead from Adam Maxwell. Nice move coming into the S's. He's going to take the lead. It's now two to go at the, at the line. Got Gabriel up at the front. Is he going to defend? Looks like he's running a slightly defensive line, but not too much. Now coming into the first corner, takes a normal racing line. And look at the speed he has through the corners. Able to get really good center traction. It's going to mean that Maxwell isn't quite in a passing opportunity yet through Monza. They come around Monza, coming out towards the little kink there. It looks like he's got just so much more traction. He's got the ability to sort of get that cart length or so gap at any given moment. And that just shows you just how well hooked up Mick Gabriel's cart is. Because when he's able to get that cart rotating well, he's able to pull gaps in the corners. That makes it really difficult. Oh, we got two spun around in the Monza with two to go. Uh, that looks like the 112. He was running up further in the pack earlier in this race in the 107. Unfortunate for them. We'll go back to the leaders here going into the cell tower. Mick Gabriel has pulled out to about a two cart length advantage, now about one. Uh, we'll see if he can hold this gap for the next lap and a half um, until we get the checkered flag. But super impressive from Mick Gabriel, smart driving from him, pushed away from Adam Maxwell, pushed away with Adam Maxwell away from the rest of the field, including Hunter Perry and Braden Johnson, and was able to get that gap that he needed to make this a two-man show. As you can see them coming through the last few corners here, coming to the white flag, Mick Gabriel blocking from Adam Maxwell where he needs to, and there's the white flag right there. Adam Maxwell, one lap to go here. Can they make a move? Will they, will they be able to change positions at all? Or is Mick Gabriel going to be able to defend enough to keep Adam Maxwell at bay behind? This is our first main event of the weekend. Will we see any contact? What is going to happen? As of now, it looks like Gabriel was able to defend well. Obviously, a little bit surprising he defended into that last chicane, but it worked out for him, was able to keep the lead. Goes defensive into Monza. That's going to set Maxwell up with a really good run. Gabriel stays defensive into the scoreboard here. And will Maxwell try to hang it around the outside? He's going to set up a crossover, potentially on an exit. Doesn't quite get a good enough exit to do that, and now that's going to give the advantage back to Gabriel coming through in the green corner. Gabriel goes defensive. Now Maxwell on the outside coming through green corner. Crosses him over, but it's not going to be enough again. The exit speed by Gabriel is just enough to sort of fend off Adam Maxwell. But now Gabriel again goes defensive into the kink. This is really aggressive defending by Mick Gabriel here. Now they're side by side in the cell tower. Oh, oh we contact into the cell tower. Adam Maxwell gets taken out, and it looked like there was not enough space for both of them. Maybe Gabriel applied a little bit of a squeeze, but that is going to end Adam Maxwell's race and his hopes for a win in about half a lap short. Dominated the race, led almost every lap up until three to go. Here comes, and now he's out. Here comes Braden Johnson into the play. We'll see if there's any moves to be made in this last few corners. This guy has been out of it for a long time, and he just now got his opportunity. We'll see if he can make anything happen here in the last corner. He's tries going to the inside. Not going to make it happen. Mick Gabriel through the last corner is going to take the first win of King of the Castle. Mick Gabriel wins the 206 Stars main event. Followed by Braden Johnson and Hunter Perry. Really unfortunate for Adam Maxwell. That was a, such a tough ending to a long race like that. Same thing happened to Danny Dushelski, and he won back in the KA, uh, KA Stars heat. Uh, that was super unfortunate to see. But racing, some, sometimes in racing, that kind of stuff happens. So uh, congrats to Mick Gabriel on an awesome win. That was a, a great way to, to start the main events here at the King of the Castle. Yeah, man. I mean, you look back at this race and just the Maxwell and Gabriel worked so well to get up to that lead. And then at the end of the day, though, it was Maxwell who just got the short end of the stick there. And certainly looking at the cell tower, not a place where you would expect to be able to hang it around the outside. It looked like Maxwell tried it, just ran out of road on the entry. And it, I mean, that's a really costly decision there. And it's going to mean that his entire race and really his start to this championship takes a really bad turn as he ends up 15th in the classification as the only runner to not finish. Yeah, super unfortunate for Adam, as you said. We'll run through the top ten. Obviously, Mick Gabriel taking the win. Braden Johnson coming home second. Hunter Perry rounding out the podium. Matthew Darlson finishing fourth. 
Keegan Clark fifth, James Brassel sixth, Harbir Das coming in seventh, Derek Sokol coming in eighth, Ryan Kastner in ninth, and Jalen Kerr rounding out your top ten here in the 206 stars. And uh, a very exciting last lap to, to have uh, that much, I guess, entertainment. I don't want to call it entertainment, but um, that much drama going down on the last lap. Uh, super unfortunate to, to see that happen to Adam Maxwell. But like I said, that's racing, and that's going to happen sometimes. But it's hard to win a championship if you don't finish in, in some of the races. So hopefully he can get his luck turned around and, and come back strong at the next race. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's a long season. Obviously, he's going to have more opportunities. He's been fast at a lot of different tracks. Obviously, sucks to lose a race like this where he was up front all weekend, but it's one of those that he'll have to bounce back from. But coming up next, we're going to have another race where we've seen two guys duel. That's going to be your mini Swift coming up on Kart Chaser. Coming up now, we have the mini Swift division rolling off on the pole position will be Isaac Malka, followed by Lucas Palacio and Max Weiland. Behind him, Sam Tutwiler and, and uh, William Kim is actually at the back of the field for this one. He had an unfortunate spin off of I-70, so he's going to be starting at the back of this field. But a super competitive race. We've seen a lot of uh, Mac Isaac Malka and Lucas Palacio pulling away from the rest of the field with Max Weiland always trying to stay right there. But we'll see if they can keep it together. Yeah, certainly. I mean, this has been a real two-horse two race between the two of them. And, I mean, you've seen Lucas Palacio and Malka in the last race had both of them made slight mistakes and that kind of forced them back into the pack a little bit. But it was Malka that ended up on top of the pre-final and just had a lot of pace to even kind of make it a make it a difficult race for Lucas Palacio. Obviously, the two of them had at one point about a second in hand on the rest of the field from a time standpoint. So they've been the dominant carts all weekend. We saw them duel in the pre-final. It might be similar to what we saw in the uh, 206 Stars class where we saw Adam Maxwell and McGabriel go head-to-head. -head. This time, a lot younger kids, maybe a little bit different strategy going on, but Malcolm and Palacio have been very fast. And as we get set for this final, I would expect that it's a duel between the two of them with maybe Max Whelan in third, who had a really good start to the pre-final and kind of fought with them for a little bit before ultimately falling back due to pace, maybe factoring in as well. As we're coming to this, the green flag for the mini Swift, Isaac Malkin on the inside, Lucas Palacio leading the outside in second. Lights are on, getting ready to go green here, and we are green racing into turn one. Mini Swift uh, main event, here we go. Turn one, Isaac Malkit. Oh, Max Weiland, look at him going to the inside on turn one. Very aggressive move for the first corner, but it's worked for him. He is now leading the race. Well, actually, no. They got back around him. He must have gone too deep into the corner. But still, super aggressive and good way to start the race off coming from third to second. And Isaac Malkit already up to a big lead. Lucas Palacio. Oh, something's wrong with Lucas Palacio. We have an issue. Lucas Palacio, our outside pole sitter, fallen back. There's something wrong with his motor. That what is, is going on? That is a heartbreak for Palacio. Been up at the front all weekend long and just could not get a good run out of the exit. It looked like something was going on with his motor, something there. He's all the way at the back of the field now. Unfortunately for him, that's going to be race over pretty much. And so for Isaac Malcutt now, now the story becomes more simple. Just drive away because that's what... That's the pace that he's had all weekend. You've got a good host of guys in that second group that are all certainly fast. I mean, Max Whelan ha almost got the start organized. You had Sam Tutwiler up into P3 now. I believe that might be Caleb Johnson in P4 possibly. But still, I mean, this is now Isaac Malkus race to lose. It's unfortunate for Lucas Palacio that seemingly a technical ailment is going to end his race before it even really got going. So not even a lap done for your outside pole sitter and someone that's been really quick all weekend long. 
Yeah, he's been able to run with Isaac Malka unlike anyone else this weekend. But unfortunately, he is in the scale house now. His race is over, which means that it's going to be in Isaac Malka's hands to go and take the win of this race with Max Weiland falling closely behind. Will Max Weiland be able to get up there and be able to run with Isaac Malka in the draft? Yeah, I mean, this is certainly something we saw from Weiland last race. He was able to be consistent for a few laps before ultimately fading off of the top two. This race now is a little bit more simple. Malka doesn't have a draft. He doesn't have anyone to push him. But if Weiland... If Wywood wants to make this race entertaining, he has to be able to get going. He has got to get up to Malkin and get into the draft, and then you can worry about the rest of it. At the moment, he's got pretty good pace. I mean, it looks like he's been matching him at least for the first lap and a half or so. But, I mean, the f after a couple of laps on the last race, Isaac Malka just came alive, absolutely destroyed the competition. And right now, that battle for third, it looks like Roman McCurdy has gotten the upper hand in that one as well, over Sam Tutwiler, who was in third. Jacob Scheibel's in that mix as well, as well as maybe Caleb Johnson, and then looking back at the back of the grip was William Kim, who took a, who took a fight through, the, or took a fight through the puddle at one point. Tutwiler makes it back into the in the turn, or into position number three, as they come through the old turn three now. Now that group still gets a little bit more unsettled as Roman McCordy kind of pushes one guy a little bit wide there, but certainly this group has been entertaining. But at the moment, up at the front, it looks like Malcolm and Wyland are very evenly matched at the moment. Both of them running 119.9s, quite a bit quicker than the second group, but certainly Wyland. He's done a nice job of staying in, intact with Malka, but certainly this is going to be the hard part of the race where he's going to have to find a way to get back up into that draft. Yeah, he's starting to lose the draft a good bit there as we go through the Monza. Jacob Scheibel able to get into the top three. That's the first time he's been inside of the top three this weekend. You can see him getting up on the wheel right there, trying to make it up to the leaders, but I don't know if he's going to be able to, but he is trying. He's getting everything he can out of that go-kart. But still, Isaac Malka, the story of this race, leading the race by about half a second to a second. Uh, and Max Weiland does not have much for him as they go over the hill and into the cell tower corner. Max Weiland needs to put his head down, break late, get on that gas early if he wants to be able to catch up to Isaac Malkut. Yeah, it's just simply not happening for him in the moment. This lap, I think Malkut has taken a chunk of time and put it in his hands and got, got a little bit more of a lead. And now at the moment, I mean, it looks like an Isaac Malkut show. And I mean, last lap he was purple but just by a few hundreds. I would expect this lap he's going to be purple possibly by a few tenths even, and at the moment, it just looks like Wyland doesn't quite have the pace to keep in tow, and at the, looking behind them at the moment, you can also see really good run from Jacob Scheibel at the, to get all the way up into P3. Tutwiler is close behind, and maybe they'll work together to see if they can, ke if they can run down Max Wyland because they're running a similar pace, but Isaac Malka on that lap took four and a half tenths from Wyland. He now has a 1.2 second lead, and it looks very comfortable for him at the moment. Yeah, super impressive from Isaac Malka to go out there and take a lead like that at a track like this with the draft and everything. Um, but he's, he's smooth sailing from here. As long as he makes no mistakes, he should be good for this race. But as we look back, Jacob Scheibel and Sam Tutwiler starting to pull away from Roman McCurdy. I saw Roman McCurdy make a little bit of a mistake here in the last corner, drove off a little bit, and he lost some time there. So as we look at those two, uh, they're really starting to get pulled by the rest of the field as we come through the kink here. Yeah, I mean, certainly that you don't want to be dropping a wheel out of the la that last corner. It's one of the most treacherous places on this track. Certainly, I can remember USPKS last year in a, any sort of layout that we've seen. We've seen a number of guys that have made that mistake, and certainly McCourty is no different. And looking at the pace standpoint, he kind of needs to pick it up a little bit to be able to keep up with Tutwiler and Scheibel. But really, I mean, this has turned into Isaac Malkut just kind of driving his own race in the sunset. You've got Max Weiland as well, who looks to be comfortable enough to hang on to P2 at least early on in this race. His pace has been pretty good, but just not good enough. And I mean, this is Isaac Malkut's coming out party. I think this is one of the best races we've seen him run on, at the regional or the national level. And certainly, I mean, he is making, making himself look very good. Another four tenths added to the lead against Weiland. Now is a 118.9 as he resets fastest time over Weiland. 1.7 seconds is now the gap. And I mean, it really just looks comfortable for him. For Weiland, this is a decent race, but at the same time, he's just struggling to keep up with that pace. And then behind them, I mean, you've got Scheibel and Tutwiler continuing to go back and forth. I believe as, you come, as they come into the scoreboard corner, you can almost see now that it looks like Tutwiler has got the position back into P3. And so good race, racing going on with them, but certainly the top two have gotten away, and each of them are kind of running their own race at the moment. Yeah, the top two, not much going on for them right now. Just out there running qualifying laps, or at least trying to, as uh, Sam Tutwiler up into the top three got around Jacob Scheibel for that last podium position as William Kim is up into fifth place, trying to run down that top three, uh, see if he can get to Sam Tutwiler and battle for that podium position. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, Tutwiler is someone 
that is going to try his best to keep that podium position. Teller has been kind of in the middle part of the field throughout the weekend. Obviously, a couple of DNFs, a little bit of attrition, and this race has meant that he's been in position to get a podium now. But, I mean, at the moment, you've got the front two obviously running their own qualifying line. William Kim has gotten up to P5, and at the moment, he looks like the guy that could be the biggest challenge to those guys fighting for the podium. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's running at the moment, a 118.9. That's quicker than anyone outside of Wyland and Malcutt. And it's really only a couple hundredths off of Max Weiland. Obviously, William Kim in the pre-final had a little bit of a struggle. Obviously, took a, took a toll through the puddle out of Term 1. That ended his race prematurely. I think he had to start this race in eighth position. So had already making a, up a few spots. And in terms of pace, he just looks like he's got it covered. But at the same time, Roman McCurdy, as I was saying all that, got by him into Turn 1 and continues to put up a fight. And McCurdy... We saw a couple of laps ago to drop the wheel, kind of had some issues with pace, but at the, as of now, it looks like he's continuing to fight on, and if Scheibel and Tutler continue to fight, it could lead to McCurdy and Kim catching back up into, into the fight for P3. Yeah, it definitely looks like uh, McCurdy and William are starting to run down third, third and fourth place here, which could make it an interesting battle for that last podium position, but I think the top two is pretty much done and sealed as long as nothing goes wrong for those two drivers. But it definitely looks like we're going to have a battle for third place as this race progresses. Yeah, and at the moment, it just looks like the leader's just not much going on. I mean, Malcott continues to run his own race. He's done what he needs to do in terms of not making any mistakes. He resets fast time again with a 118.2. Wyland, again, continues to improve, but just not enough to keep pace with him. He's about three-tenths off of what he needs to be at. Tutwiler and Scheibel and McCordy are all about a second off the pace, if not more. And William Kim is out here. He got passed by... McCurdy on the last lap. We'll see what he's doing on this lap. I believe as we come through, it looks like Tutler might have made a little bit of a mistake on the first part of the lap as now Scheibel is around him, and now the third through six are all in one big group at the moment. And we might see Roman McCurdy here trying to make a move within the next lap as he's right on the bumper of Sam Tutler now. Yeah, really finally caught up to, to Sam Tutler and Jacob Scheibel. They've been battling a little bit, which has slowed them down a uh, quite a bit, and William Kim and Roman McCurdy have worked together to get back up to them, and they have gotten there, so this should create a good battle for that final podium position. It's obviously a good start to the championship if you can get up on the box like that, so they're all going to be going after it, and they're all fighting for that one position. So we'll oh, William, oh, William Kim's around. Kim's around. Yeah, that's one of the guys he was running in. I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure he was in sixth at the time, so that's going to no knock him down the order a little bit, but uh, that'll, that'll take him out of contention for that podium spot. Yeah, certainly just a learning experience for William Kin. We saw in the pre-final, ran off the track coming out of turn one. Now in the final, looks like he might have clipped a curve on the entrance of the double left and just spun it. Obviously, the track has been a little bit wet. Might still be a little bit of wet spots on the grass. Never know what happened, but certainly really rough start to the season for William Kim. But it was he showed some good pace throughout, and we'll see. I mean, it's a long season. You have opportunities, and certainly the young driver in the Nitro Kart has a lot of pace in him, and we saw that so far this weekend. But in the meantime... You can look back up front. I mean, it continues to be the eyes at Malcutt show. He's in P1, comfortably ahead of Max Wylan in P2. Did not improve his lap time that time. Wylan was only two tenths off. So on an individual level, he continues to improve. And when you get in these races like this and you have sort of a big gap between you and the carts in front of you and behind you, and you're just trying to knock off qualifying laps, I feel like there's a lot, a lot that can go into just improving. And Max Wylan is a young driver. There's a lot of potential to improve. And obviously... He's going to be at this for a while. So just these chances to continue to learn. It's almost like a practice session out there. Just continue to get better, learn the track more, continue to get more comfortable with it. Might pay dividends going forward. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering what Isaac Malkwitz thinking about right now because I sure know when I start leading races and it's it becomes a race like this, I start wandering and I start thinking about the most random things. So hopefully Isaac Malkwitz can keep his head on straight and uh, walk away with this win like he is right now. But it looks like he's, he's still tucking and focused. So... Uh, I don't think he would be wandering quite as much as I usually do. <laughs> yeah, well, when you're wandering and still three tenths clear of the field, I mean, uh, you're doing what you're doing. So at that point, it just it doesn't matter what he's thinking about if he's going fast. So, I mean, Isaac Malka, he's in his own dimension. He's been clearly the dominant car this weekend alongside Lucas Palacio. Unfortunately, we'll never get to know how he would have raced in this final. But certainly, I mean, Isaac has all of all of the reason in the world to think about whatever he's eating for dinner tonight or potentially any sort of moves he might be making, any plans, certainly. I mean, he is absolutely dominant so far in Newcastle this weekend. Yeah, impressive from him and a bunch of the other drivers. Roman McCurdy now up into that third position. He started uh, further back in the field and had to make his way up there. 
But um, super impressive from him as well as he's now past Jacob Scheibel and some T Sam Tutwiler after coming from behind. Yeah, I mean at the moment it just looks like this group of this group of five, three cards now from third to fifth, and McCurdy, Scheibel, and Tutwiler continue to battle it out. McCurdy has probably the mo best roll pace out of all of them. Doing in the he's running in the high 118s, which is still a ways off of what Isaac Malcut did a 117.9 the last time around. But still, just clearly a good pace and a good run for McCurdy. Fell back to sixth at one point. Started this race in seventh. Now he's in the third, and it looks like he's got a good shot at a podium. Also, I have Jacob Scheibel continuing to race him closely, though. And they're starting to drop Sam Tutwiler a little bit. I don't know if it's something to do with his tire pressures, just individual mistakes. But certainly, these last couple laps, Tutwiler has started to lose the pace a little bit compared to what McCurdy and Scheibel are doing. Yeah, as we continue to watch this race, Isaac Malkut still just putting a clinic on the field, uh, just driving away from him. I'm sure he's just taking it easy now, not hanging any tires, not putting a wheel wrong, and he'll be good as we watch Roman McCurdy, Jacob Scheibel. Uh, Jacob Scheibel's right there. Roman McCurdy's starting to throw a little bit of a block. We got about one minute and 30 seconds left on the clock, so it's about that time we start battling for that podium position. Yeah, and obviously you can see McCurdy starting to Play a little bit of defensive. I don't know if it's necessary or not. You're only racing two other carts, and obviously he's still going to have more opportunities over the next couple of laps. So he's got the quickest, probably the quickest cart in the group. He's shown that over the last few laps. But meanwhile, I mean, it's just absolute stroll out there for Isaac Malcott. And just looking at those guys third through fifth, they're all stacking up. That's a wild tall to get back into the fight because, because McCurdy went defensive. And now, I mean, you're coming down. You probably only got three laps to go at this point. It's going to be... Smooth sailing for Isaac Malcott unless he drops a wheel. It's going to be a second place for Max Wheel and a pretty good pace, it must be said. I mean, he's picked it up to being only about three tenths or so off of what Malcott's doing. Now, this last lap, as I say, that he goes six tenths slower, so I guess I just kind of jinxed him there. But certainly, I mean, he's had a good, clean race, and I think that's about all you can ask for realistically. And then Scheibel, McCurdy, and Tutwell are just going to continue to fight it out. And obviously, I mean, McCurdy's going defensive every lap. Now, Tutwell is going to try and stick it back up the inside of of Jacob Scheibel, and he looks like he's got the position into I-70 now coming out towards the Monza. You can see McCurdy's got a little bit of the space from him to Tutwiler, and at the, these three are going to continue to fight it out, I would imagine, and certainly Tutwiler probably doesn't have the cart compared to McCurdy, but with the draft effect here, it's just so strong, and I mean, you just have to be within about four or five tenths, and you're going to have the rest of the job done for you. Yeah, as we continue here, we're going to get the two to go this time by. It's going to the number 175 of Isaac Malkut as he is going to come across this line. On the come across the line and get the two to go, as long as nothing goes wrong, he should have this win in the bag. He's drove a perfect race, not put a wheel wrong, and has led on just about every single lap so far. And he's, uh, he's uh, driven away from the rest of the field. Uh, super impressive from him as uh, he's about half, half a straightaway in front of uh, Max Weiland and then probably a straightaway and a half in front of third place. So... Uh, it's exciting to watch him grow as a driver and, and grow as a person, and I'm excited to watch him uh, throughout the rest of the season. Yeah, and still, I mean, even with that, Malka still looks back on the front straightaway, which is a little bit bizarre considering that he's about a whole zip code ahead of him. He's in Newcastle, and uh, Max Weiland is in Spiceland. So, I mean, you've got that kind of gap, and at the moment, you've got the guys on third continuing to fight. It looks like Roman McCurdy went defensive into the I-70 with only two laps remaining. Now is the time to start getting aggressive for that podium fight. Sam Tutwiler is in fourth and continues. Like I mentioned, he's just able to stick around in the draft. And now at this point, it doesn't matter because McCurdy's going to have to go defensive. And that's going to allow both Tutwiler and Scheibel to have the opportunity to stay right up there with them. As they come into green corner, will Tutwiler try to make a move? McCurdy goes defensive. All three of them go to the bottom of the track. And certainly, I mean, this is... This has gotten serious. You have a podium on the plate for these kids. It's certainly something where they're going to fight as hard as they can to get that position. Yeah, and while all that's going on, Isaac Malkut's still out front, leading in front of Max Weiland by about half of a straightaway, um, while the third, fourth, pl fifth place drivers battle it out for that last podium position. Isaac Malkut coming through the last two corners here to take the white flag. One more lap to go for Isaac Malkut as he has put an absolute show on for the whole field. He has been way faster, about three to four to five tenths a lap faster than everyone, including Max Weiland in second place. Just absolutely impressive. Uh, and as the rest of the field, Roman McCurdy comes across the line to get one lap to go. He blocks down the straightaway all the way to the inside. He doesn't even have anyone behind him, and he's blocking. But um, still, though, I mean, you got to protect. You never know what the person behind you is going to do as they come through the red 171 corner goes Isaac Malquit, and the rest of the field follows in through into the Monza, goes Roman McCurdy. 
no one's going to make a move yet. Sam Tutwiler staying behind still um, as they come through the red 171 hairpin. Roman McCurdy still hanging on to that third place position. This would be a breakout weekend for him if he could get a podium in this race as he goes through the green corner. No moves yet by Sam Tutwiler. Jacob Scheibel also staying in line behind Sam Tutwiler for that fifth position as a... Uh, all of them come through over the hill into the cell tower. Still no moves. Not close enough for Sam Tutwiler to make a move on Roman McCurdy. We'll see if there's anything left as they come through the high-speed chicanes for the last part of the lap. Uh, it looks like Sam Tutwiler is about a, half a cart length behind. And while all this is happening, our winner, uh, dominant race, Isaac Malka is going to take the win in Mini Swift as he goes two hands in the air. Absolutely proud of himself, and he has all the reason to be as Max Wallen puts his hand in the air for finishing second. Drove a great race as the leaders have already finished. The third place driver, Roman McCurdy, coming across the line right now. He's going to throw his hand in the air. He's excited. He got a podium. Great for him. Uh, it's a big breakout weekend for him as all three drivers on the podium are absolutely thrilled to have come away with that podium finish and uh, all, the, all the power to him. Uh, great, great, week, great race, and uh, lacked a little bit at the front, but you know those drivers put on a clinic and, and drove drove their own races, and uh, it's it's proud. You got to be proud of yourself of that. So, uh, congrats to Isaac Malquit, Max Wyland, and Roman McCurdy on their podium finishes, and uh, the rest of the field, Jacob Scheibel and Sam Tutwiler. Good job to them as well, along with um, the rest of the field. Yeah, and obviously Caleb Johnson finishing in sixth place. William Kevin Kevin seventh. Obviously had that issue. And the backside of the track where he spun, but other than that, a lot of good pace from Kim. Unfortunately, Charlie Myers finished eighth, Cable Winter ninth, Lucas Palacio really sticks out at the end of the field. So one dude did not even get to fit, run a single lap as your outside pole sitter. But in the meantime, Isaac Malka, incredible race for him. Ended up winning by 3.8 seconds, slowed down a little bit on the last lap, got to get the celebration going, but certainly an outstanding race for him and a great winner at the King of the Castle. We'll be back next for KA Masters on Car Chaser. USA, a top-level performance team with unmatched hospitality, offering a full-service driver development program with year-round testing available in Miami, Florida, and the official North America racing team of Parallel Racing Chassis. Chassis and parts available at ParallelUSA.com. Next up here is the KA Masters Division as Larry Pegram goes spinning around on the warm-up lap. Wow, Ryan Castor would take the pole position, but I think Larry Pegram should be able to get out of the gas, out of the grass, as he's jumping in his cart to try and get that thing going. That's unfortunate for him, but Ryan Castor is showing sportsmanship as he's slowing down to try and let the rest of the field catch up and let Larry Pegram catch up after he spun around on the warm-up lap. Uh, that was uh, interesting. I've done that before, so I can't really say much about it. But still, you don't want to do that, especially in the main event. That's not the perfect time to go all the way to the back of the field. Yeah, and I mean, Pegram has been dominant all weekend, but nobody's immune to making mistakes. And on the first warm-up lap, we've seen it before. We've seen guys this weekend that have made mistakes on the warm-up lap. We'll have to see if you can get caught off. Obviously, usually you would expect them to go around an extra time. A, I don't think that's going to matter because I think Pegram's going to be able to get all the way up to the end of the queue by that time. And B, I mean, at some point, Star just has not seemingly wanted to let guys get back into position if it's their mistake that was the reason they got back. So we'll have to see on that. But Pegram's going to get up there and make it a moot point anyways. rest of your starting lineup goes with Ryan Castro, obviously, in P2. Row 2 is going to be Derek Sokol and Jared Tracy. Row 3, Jason Ewers and Chris Stevens. Row 4, Peter Cook and Gordon Cameron. Row 5 is Bob Davis and Thomas Gressner. Row 6 is Gallo Barros and Tyler Prestle, who we saw of the issue in the pre-final. And row 7, rounding out your field, is Nathan Roya and Nick Lundgren. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. Larry Pegram has put on a clinic so far this weekend. 
And I think he's got his tires warm after spinning out. So we'll see if he's able to, to go pretty quick on those first few laps as they set in the tram lines. Larry Pegram on the inside. Ryan Kastner on the inside. Lights are on. Here we go. Our starter, Justin Dittrich, turns the lights off, and we're away for KA Masters. Green flag is in the air. Larry Pegram leading them to the green flag. Derek Sokol in third, and uh, that's Ryan Castle trying to go around the outside. Yeah, it looks like Castro tried to go around the outside of, of I-70. just did not quite work out for him. He was able to put himself back into P2 at that. So it was a good job for him to just stay back in lines. We got a little bit of chaos going on in the back part of the field, coming through the Monza, but still really good run so far. Everyone's staying clean. Larry Peckham into the race lead. Larry Castro is in second. We saw this in the pre-final. Castro tried everything to get up to him, briefly took the lead, but just could not have the pace to quite get up there. Derek Sokol's in third, and we saw in that race as well, Sokol did not quite have the pace he needed to match those front two, and we'll see how that evolves. So far, so good for him, but at the moment, it's still Larry Pegram able to get a little bit of a lead on this first lap. Castro, again, has been so good in the back half of this lap. That's where he made his money in the pre-final. That's where he was able to close up to Larry Pegram over the course of a few laps, and now Larry Pegram is able to keep control of this race so far, but certainly Caster is not too far behind. He's going to go for it, coming into the S's, and he's got the position. Ryan Caster already making a move on lap one of this race, making up for maybe a little bit of lost time in the pre-final where he could not get by him. He was a little bit too patient with his opportunities. He's right up there in the lead. He goes defensive coming down the main straight. Look at the speed Larry Pegram has down the trail. Wow. He's going to clear him without even going clear. He didn't even need a draft to get it. He just straight up drove right by him, but Caster was able to cross him over out of the corner. It looks like Pegram's going to swoop through and take the lead back from Ryan Caster. And man, if you've got the straight line speed that Larry Pegram has, you don't even need to be in the draft. You can just make it happen all on your own. Yeah, that was uh, funny. I mean, he just went to the outside and drove right around him through the kink in turn one. Um, I mean, it worked for him. He almost got crossed up, but well, I guess I shouldn't say crossed up because he was on the outside, but Kastner almost made it stick, but Larry Pegram was able to hold it and go around the outside of, of Ryan Kastner and take away the lead on lap two. Yeah, I mean, Pegram, that, that amount of power that he had coming down the straight, I don't know if it was a great run or what, but he was able to just absolutely drive straight past Kastner. Kastner made a really good move on the back side of the track to get himself into the lead, and then Pegram just wasted absolutely no time getting him back. Now we'll see again how this evolves coming through now this the scale line corner, Caster again gets right up towards them, but this time Peg Pegram is able to keep the lead. Caster's a little bit too far back, and now as they come onto the main straightaway again, let's see if Ryan Caster can do anything, see if he can pull off what Larry Pegram did this pass off and drive around the outside, but I don't think he has the power or the run to be able to do that. Yeah, he's going to try and get by him, but I think he's going to stay at bay. But um, later in the race, I'm sure we got uh, still 11 minutes to go in this race before we get the two to go, so plenty of time for Ryan Kastner, but... If you remember in the pre-final, he waited a little bit too long. And on the last lap, Larry Pegram got himself a little bit of a gap. And it cost Ryan Kastner the race. So I think Ryan Kastner learned his lesson. And he's going to try and get to the lead a little bit sooner this race. Yeah, I mean, certainly Pegram has had the sort of the hold on this race weekend the entire time. I mean, he's been the fastest card throughout. But Kastner was right there in the pre-final. And I feel like if he had just kind of utilized his window a little bit more and kind of optimized his race, he probably looking back on it, would have wanted to have gone more aggressive and tried to make that move as many times as possible. And as we look so far, it looks like Derek Sokol is getting dropped, albeit not quite as quickly as what we saw in the heat race, but still not ideal for him. But certainly the top two of Caster and Pegram are able to get this gap. Will we see Caster try to go for a move in the front side of the track again this time? We'll see. This time he stays in line compared to Pegram. Pegram looks like he went a little bit wide coming out of the scale line corner. That allowed for Caster to be right up on his bumper, but at the moment... It looks like Pegram's got him covered. Now coming back down the straightaway, and Pegram's just so good out of that last corner and gets such a good run that it's hard for Caster to really pull up, although I think this time he might be close enough to make a move, but he's just going to stick right behind him. So again, playing the patient game. We saw it in the first heat, or in the pre-final, and we're seeing it again now, although now he's been able to pull up alongside of him coming out of I-70. Pegram has to go defensive into Monza, and that allows for a little bit of for Derek Sokol to get a little bit closer, but I think Caster is still content to stay in line. I don't know if Pegram made a mistake or what, but certainly not ideal for him coming out of I-70. Yeah, and one driver to watch is the 217 Cosmic Cart of Tyler Pressel. He had an issue, and he had a mechanical failure coming out of the pit lane. Didn't even make it on the track for the pre-final. So he's going to try and make his way back up. He's already up into the sixth position. He just passed Chris Stevens in the Monza, but he has a lot of space in front of him to go run down 
fifth place, Jared Tracy, but he's one to watch when we move forward here as the two leaders are starting to push away from the rest of the field, including Derek Sokol, J Jason Ewers, and Jared Tracy in fifth place. Yeah, and Pegram obviously has a lot of speed, but he keeps hitting that curve on the inside of the scale line corner, and that just really messes up with his rhythm. And I don't know, it feels like he's a little bit more on, on edge than he has been throughout the weekend, and Caster's really putting the pressure on. Again, Pegram goes a little bit defensive down the front straightaway. Obviously, you can get away with that as the I-70 isn't on until all the way at the end of the straight, but still, just Caster continues to be right there, and I think... Maybe for him, he might want to take advantage of it while the iron is strike while the iron is hot to be able to get into the lead and then kind of play as the aggressor. But at the moment, Pickham's just been able to kind of bend that off and make sure that he hasn't had that opportunity. And there goes Kastner to the lead. Kastner's going to take the lead here on lap number four. Uh, that Pegram does not want to give it up as Pegram's going to go straight back to the inside, but he's not going to be able to make it stick as they go around green corner into the kink. That allows Kastner to get a little bit of a gap as they head down into the cell tower corner. Uh, super impressive from Kastner, that pass into the red 171 hairpin. Uh, super clean, went to the inside, broke late, and got on the inside. And uh, Then Pegram tried getting him right back in the next corner, but could not make it stick. So that's going to move Kastner up into the lead and Pegram to P2. Derek Sokol also trying to close the gap, and that's going to kind kind of help him close that gap up as they had side-by-side -side for about two corners um, as Kastner comes through the last few corners here to complete lap number four as the first time leading this race. Yeah, Kastner able to get a little bit of a gap over the course of that, obviously, Pegram tried to make a move coming through green corner, and it just did not work for him. But look at the straight line speed of Larry Pegram. He's been able to close that gap all the way within about a cart length or so, and now he's right back on Caster just about. And so this is the part of the track where Pegram has been really good consistently and was able to create that gap to Caster in the first part of the pre-final. Now you see Caster's in front. Now Pegram's behind. It's a little bit of a role reversal from what we've seen. Just have to wonder. I mean, Pegram has, se has seemingly not wanted to be anywhere other than the lead throughout this entire weekend and today looks like it's no different we've already seen him try a couple of times on caster we saw it where he and caster initially got by and then Pegram was able to get him back coming down the straightaway again now we see caster maybe hit the curb a little bit coming through the kink that's going to cost him a little bit of time but still Pegram's just not quite close enough yet he gets right up to his bumper on the breaking uh, under the braking for the cell tower so really good racing here by both caster and Pegram as they continue their battle between each other yeah, last time by, when Ryan Kastner made that pass, he went purple. He was the fastest driver on the track that last time by. Um, that shows his speed that he has and why he took that lead, because he knew he was faster than what Larry Pegram has right now. And you can see him starting to build a gap. This is the first time we've seen someone drive away from Larry Pegram like this. But we are getting to Larry Pegram's st strong part of the racetrack, which is down the straightaway, turn one, and the Monza corner. So we'll see if Larry Pegram can close up the gap here right now. Adjusting the carb as he goes down the straightaway, maybe, maybe making a little bit of a tweak. I don't know what that would be for, but certainly he's trying to get as much as he can. Caster continues to be out front. Let's so look at the lap times. The last lap around, he did a 115.9, just a little bit off of his own best lap of the race on the lap where he passed Pegram, which was a 115.6. Certainly a lot of speed in, in here from Caster. He's shown throughout the weekend that he's got the potential to be right up the front. Pegram has controlled the races throughout the weekend, but still, he's going to have to find a little bit more pace in that car to be able to get back up to Kastner and challenge for the win. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Ryan Kastner kind of just managing that gap right now, uh, about a three or four cart length gap as they head into the cell tower corner. And still, Derek Sokol is trying to, trying to kind of catch up to the pack. Not really fast enough. He's been a little bit inconsistent. I've seen him do 15s, uh, and I've seen him do 16. Last lap, he did a 16.8, which is not a very good lap time for him as the leaders are in the 15-second bracket. So he's going to need a little bit more time than that if he wants to try and run down these leaders as the race winds down. Looks like Caster ran a little bit wide out of the scale tower. That's going to... Oh, he's, he's wide again coming out of the out of the chicane there. And now Pinkram is right, Pinkram's right on him coming down the straight. Caster there had it in control. And, and Pinkram's going to try going to the outside again and see if he can make that happen. But no, Caster blocks off the outside. Larry looks to the inside, but not going to be able to make it happen as the drivers are side by side coming down into the Monza corner. Larry Pegram wants the lead. As you can tell, he's going for it. He just went to the inside, and he's going to take the lead away from Ryan Kastner just like that. Ryan Kastner made a couple mistakes, and Ryan Kastner right back to the inside. These guys are going after it as he Bang drives wheels. off the track. Let Ryan Kastner does not leave him enough space. They're not going to give each other that much. Oh, Ryan Kastner waited up for him because he realized that he made a mistake right there. And Ryan Kastner shows some sportsmanship. Well, that was really good sportsmanship. I cannot say that I would do the same in that situation, but 
good on Ryan Castner. They're going to resume their duel now side by side. It looks like Castner might be trying to let him go. I don't know if Pegram realizes that, but still, I think he might have just given up on it. But still, good racing between these two. And because of their incident and because of the fact that Castner has waited up, that means now Derek Sokol is back in the battle again. And so these two have had a really entertaining battle so far. Now it might end up being three. As we'll see if Castro can go through it cleanly this time through the last couple Still corners. Still getting really loose First. through all these corners right here. You see him working the wheel as we have three minutes and 45 seconds to go here with a little bit more time than, than uh, Ryan Kastner was hoping for. Ryan Kastner, I'm sure he wishes the white flag was out right now as he is leading into the I-70 corner. And Derek Sokol is right there. He's got about three cart lengths until he is up onto Larry Pegram's bumper as they head into the Monza. Ryan Kastner still leading, but Larry Pegram, as we know, is not very patient. He wants to lead as soon as he can go for it. As they're going to go through the red 171 corner, they're going to stay in line. Yeah, and Kastner continues to lead. Obviously, it looks like he is fighting that cart on the ragged edge, but it's working for him. He's been fast. Obviously, last slap around notwithstanding, that was a little bit rough, but... You look at it, and Derek Sokol, on one hand, he's got the pace to be fast. He ran a 1.59, but just has not consistently been able to put it together. Since that point, he's been 16.8s the last three laps. And that just quite simply won't get it done against guys like Castor and Pegram, who have been really quick the entire race. And now castor has got a little bit of a gap, but once you see coming down the straightaway the amount of speed that Pegram has, and certainly the back half of the track, or the front half of the track in general, that changes things. It's now, again... Castor gets a little bit out of shape coming out of the scale tower. He gets, he's able to get away with it, though, and he's actually pulled the gap a little bit more. So now they come down to take another lap off the books. Probably got four to go in this one. And Sokol, again, picks it up a little bit in third, but still losing about three or four tenths a lap to these guys. So castor has got it covered in P1. Pegram's in P2. He's just a little bit too far back to make a move at this point, but he's certainly right there. Sokol's in P3, and then it's Jason Ewers and Jared Tracy, about four and a half seconds back from that group, rounding out the top five. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting race down to the line. we got about two minutes, just a little over two minutes left to go until we get the two to go, which should equate to about four laps left, three and a half to go in this race. It is going to start getting interesting here as we go through the green corner. Still no changes for position for the lead. Derek Sokol starting to lose that lead groove a little bit. Tyler Pressel still trying to make up time and catch up to Jared Tracy and Jason Ewers as they are going around the track at about a 17-2. Tyler Pressel is at a 17-1. That is not enough to make up about a five-second gap between those two. So I think the battle for fifth and sixth is not going to be one we need to watch. Just the battle for the lead and the battle for the fourth position as we watch Jason Ewers and Jared Tracy follow each other around the racetrack just like we see with Ryan Kastner and Larry Pegram as they're starting to drive away from Derek Sokol. As soon as they got in line with each other and started working together, Derek Sokol just can't hold on to them. So as we cross the line, we're going to have about, I want to say, three laps to go. We might get four if we're lucky. If we go into the I-70 corner and Ryan Kastner still holding on to the lead here, Larry Pegram is not going to be patient for much longer as time is winding down on the clock. Yeah, and it looks like Castor and Pegram are back into the 115 time frame. I mean, this is really good racing here. Is now Pegram's going to go goes. down the inside again into scoreboard. He gets the position. Castor tries to cross him over, not happening. Let's we'll see if Pegram goes defensive. He does. Castor's not willing to make a move there, so certainly it works out for Pegram. Gets back into the lead where he's been for most of the weekend, and we'll see. I mean, this is really nice to have the front two dueling. We've seen this so far in the in the. LO206 Stars class, we've seen it now in KA Masters. We could have seen it in the Mini Swift class. It's really good to have battles up at the front, and Castor and Pegram have put on a show so far in the final, and we've still got a couple more laps of this, and it looks like it's going to come down to just being who's in the right place at the right time, and we'll see. Castor could throw a little bit of a surprise here if Pegram doesn't get defensive. He runs a little bit of a defensive line coming out of the scale tower corner coming through. There we go, two now. to go. They are going to yeah. give them the two to go this time by as... As you said, Pegram is getting a little bit defensive as they have two to go. He goes to the bottom of the racetrack. We saw Pegram go to the outside in turn one, but we don't think that Ryan Kastner has the gear ratio to do that. He looks to the inside, thinks about it, but is not going to do it. Pegram coming out of turn one, going to get a good run going down into the monster. He's about a cart length gap. Not going to be able to make a pass here as Kastner going through the monster. Kastner gets oh. loose. That's going to hurt him. This is a kind of what we saw in the prefrontal where he makes a mistake and loses him with two to go. Let's see if he'll be able to reel Kat or Pegram back in on these last two laps. Just a little bit deep on the brakes there for Ryan Caster, just trying to get as much as he could, just overstepped a little bit, ran into the back of Pegram, got him loose, got out of shape, got out of line. 
lost a couple cart links, although now he's been able to clo close back in through green corner. And now as they come back to the cell tower area, he is not that far back. And now as they come around through the double left, so it looks like it could be Kastner back into position to challenge for the lead. Pegram has certainly had the defensive line. He's made sure there's no opportunity for Kastner. And as they come onto the shoot towards the scale line corner, it looks like looks like Pegram's got enough of a gap to stay consistent. Although, oh, both of them oh, get into the grass. Goes the Kastner got it. Oh, he oh, shifted in hit. there. But now Pegram continues to lead this race as they both got side by side there. Caster tried into the S's, did not quite work out. Pegram looks like he's going to go defensive down the straightaway. He had enough of a gap as there's a yellow flag, I think, coming into turn one. That might thwart any opportunity, although I don't know if Pegram picked up on that. He still went defensive. And it looks like now both of them are going to go a little bit wide on exit from one. Pegram again goes defensive coming into Monza, although Kastner uh, doesn't go enough. Go defensive enough. Yeah, Kastner was Ka able to fit, fit it down the inside. Now they're going side by side. Kastner has to curve, kind of thwarts his momentum a little bit, but still, they're oh, both right there. Pegram tries giving him the bumper. They're going to be side by side. Nope, Kastner gets the better run off the corner. Kastner does not need to block, and he is not going to. Pegram has about a cart length until he can get to Kastner. They're going through the kink here. Pegram has about two cart lengths now on before he can get to Kastner. Kastner has a good lead going into the cell tower. He will not need to block. Pegram needs to hit a good couple of corners if he wants a chance at getting around Kastner with about five corners to go here. Will Kastner be able to hold on, or will Pegram be able to get up there and get around Kastner? Pegram has been leading this whole weekend, qualified on pole, won both heat races, won the pre-final, and now it's Kastner's time. Kastner leading by about three car lengths as we head into three corners to go. Kastner's going to have this one in the bag. Two corners to go. Coming to the checkered flag. Kastner is going to win here at Stars in the KA Masters final. Good job. That was an incredible race between those two. Those guys were going back and forth the whole race. And you see them fist bump as they cross the line. Kastner, oh, we got one spun around coming across the line right here. Hopefully others can see him and he can get out of the way. Oh, he needs to go. He needs to go. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know if he stayed in front of him. But uh, that was a good race between the leaders and... Congrats to uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Kastner, Larry Pegram, and Derek Sokol on their podium. That was a, a cr and pretty, pretty incredible race to watch between those two guys. They were going after it until the last lap. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly one of the more intense races we've seen in K Masters. You have to wonder if Pegram could have gotten back to the bumper. Will you put a little bit of a move on Ryan Kastner? I guess we'll never know, but certainly really good racing from Kastner. Upsetting Larry Pegram had been up, up on the top all weekend long, all the way until the final Great racing from Kastner, great racing from Pegram, and now we get set to go to the KA Stars. A 40-cart field will take the green, coming up next on Cart Chaser. Group A Apparel, designed for the athlete and all of us. Check out more online at groupaapparel.com. Apparel in USA, a top-level performance team with unmatched hospitality. Offering a full-service driver development program with year-round testing available in Miami, Florida. And the official North America racing team of Peril and Racing Chassis. Chassis and parts available at perilinusa.com. 
If you're looking for top grade equipment, look no further than Rev Performance Materials engine mounts, sprockets, and RK chains. Available online now at RevPerformanceMaterials.com and through a dealer near you. The highest quality material built to the highest quality standards. Rev Performance Materials. Welcome back here live from Newcastle Motorsports Park. My name is Xander Clements. Alongside me is Connor Zillish, and we've already gotten through a number of main events here today. Next up, it is the biggest one we will see yet. The KA Stars are onto the racetrack here. Connor, we've seen a little bit of controversy in this class, but for the most part, all of our heavy hitters will be starting inside the top 10 after we had quite a few guys have some heroic drives in that pre-final A. Yeah, it was interesting for sure. Uh, a couple of uh, big names in the heat races getting in some contact and, and having some drama. Um, but we, we're, uh, we're getting ready to go racing here. We got a bunch of teammates up at the front. I'm seeing a lot of TKG carts, and I'm seeing a lot of MPG um, with Chase Jones and Elliot Budzinski starting up near the front. Let's take you through the starting lineup here really quickly while they make their way around the final corner. Gavin Bailiff in the TKG Cart Republic makes it a Cart Republic front row alongside Connor Ferris. Nikita Panaris and Chase Jones make up row two. Tyler Wettengel, Adam Maxwell, row three. Keegan Bosch, Elliot Budzinski, row four. We are on the power nice and early, and the lights are out. We're underway down to turn number one for the biggest main event on the weekend. Can they all make it through the I-70 hairpin? There's Tyler Wettengel oh, spun in front of the field. You want to see. Oh, and they are going to stack them up there. There's probably eight, nine, ten go-karts all collected as one of the top starters here. Tyler Wettengel rolled off fifth. Got turned right in front of the pack. Logan Mueller's involved. Budzinski's involved. Yeah, that looks like about 10 go-karts, I'd say, involved in that one. And we got two in the water down inside of the Monza corner. Unfortunate for them, but Gavin Bailiff and Nikita Panaris with a perfect start to their race as they get a good jump on the field. Uh, Gavin Bailiff has about a six or seven cart length lead up over his teammate Nikita Panaris as that looks like Finnegan Bailiff is up into the fourth position. So we have three Trinity Karting Group Kart Republics inside of the top four. Super impressive from them. Yeah, what a great start for them. Again, not a great start for the likes of Chase Jones, who was second on the outside lane and the rest of the outside row. As you can see, it is spread out completely up front. Jones finds himself battling to get back one spot. He'll get down the inside on one of the other TKG entries, entering through the grid corner, trying to identify who that was. That was the 920 machine. Uh, one of the uh, Jonah Hanran, who was up five spots here. He had to work his way up the order in that pre-final A. So here they come out of I-70 for lap number two. Gavin Bailiff, your leader. Connor Ferris, second. Panaris is third, fourth on the racetrack. Just a little further back is going to be Finnegan Bailiff. What a great start it was for Finnegan. You're talking about a guy had to start at the back end of that pre-final. Drove through nearly 15 or 16 spots to get to the top ten. And now he's inside the top five early on. The downside is here, it's a big gap still for him to close up as you see the field working their way out of the red 171 hairpin and towards the back sector. You got the leaders breaking away, second and third trying to hunt down Gavin Bailiff, Finn Bailiff in fourth. And here's Hunter Perry's group exiting the cell tower. He's got Keegan Bosch in line, Chase Jones right there, De Cesaro, and then it looks to be uh, Jonah Hanran back in the ninth position as, oh, Hunter Perry had a charge from Keegan Bosch coming out of the horseshoe. Here comes Chase Jones with the momentum. He'll get by Jones and take over that position as they go through the grid corner once again. So Jones now up to sixth, rebounding back, but the gaps, they're going to be pretty massive here at the end of lap number two. Let's see if we can get an idea of where everybody's at. It's a one-second lead for Gavin Bailiff, uh, about a half second from Connor Ferris back to Nikita Panaris, and another second and a quarter Till Finn Bailiff, a second and a quarter as well from him. Back to uh, Hunter Perry and Chase Jones. Perry up 14 spots, it looks like. I don't know if that's fully accurate, but he's definitely way up the order from where he was originally slotted to start. Yeah, definitely. And Connor Ferris just went purple that time by about three and a half tenths over top of uh, Gavin Bailiff. That looks like in the lead, did a 114.3. He was in a 114 flat, so super fast times. For our second lap here for the KA Stars, Connor Ferris trying to run down Gavin Bailiff as he's starting to get in, dra in drafting range, so that will help him in his run to catch up to, to Gavin Bailiff. And Nikita Panaris is really starting to get dropped as the, the end of this lap concludes. 
Yeah, they're going to work their way out of the horseshoe now here. You can see the gap slowly closing. Gavin Bailiff knows it as well. Took a look over the shoulder. He sees a big black and blue machine coming his way. Connor Ferris has been the fastest driver all weekend long from the end of the day on Friday practice. Won both of his heat races. Nearly won the pre-final here today. And right now he is hunting down the leader with the fastest lap time of the session. Three and a half tenths clear of Gavin Bailiff and anybody else on the racetrack for that matter. Blisteringly quick here is Connor Ferris. That gap was one second. It's down to less than seven tenths as they enter the Monza. Yeah, super impressive from Connor. Just consistent lap times, consistently three tenths faster than anyone else out there. Nikita Panaris has got to be demoralized with how fast Connor Ferris has pulled away from him. And same with Finnegan Bailiff. Um, they're not going to be able to help their teammate that much as Connor Ferris is running down Gavin Bailiff as the rest of the field comes through. Chase Jones got himself up into fifth and has clear track ahead of him and a little bit less pressure than usual behind him as he's going to start trying to run down that podium position. So we'll see if he gets there. You can see Finn Bailiff in the background closing in to Nikita Panaris just as the leaders are closing together. Here is Panaris and Finn Bailiff exiting the horseshoe, headed towards the back short shoot into the scale tower corner. Again, two car lengths between them, two car lengths between the leaders. They'll come on through, and we'll pick them up as they exit through the grid turn. So might see a change in position for the lead soon. I think before that, we'll see a change for third. Chase Jones behind. We'll keep a tab on his pace as he trails by about two seconds back from third and fourth. Exactly two seconds, to be exact. Uh, just 2.9 seconds off the lead for Finn Bailiff. Five seconds back from the lead for... Uh, Chase Jones, Finn Bailiff, able to get by. It looked like back in turn number one, and indeed he's through. Fit, uh, Nikita Panaris back to fourth. Finnegan Bailiff up to third, and look at that. Jones is getting shuffled. He's lost two spots already, hanging on for dear life as Adam Maxwell goes to town on him. And up front, there's an attempt for the lead. Connor Ferris not able to get the job done, and Gavin Bailiff took a look down the inside. This is one of those situations, Connor. You see some drivers, if they're in Gavin's position, they'll start low-lining now to hopefully bring that group into the mix if they think that Connor Ferris is going to be able to pull away from him. Yeah, I think Gavin Bailiff has the pace to hang with Connor Ferris. I just think that with the draft and, and having a, a carrot like that to chase for Connor Ferris, that he is able to go that fast. So I think that once Connor Ferris gets out front, I don't think he will be able to pull away from Gavin Bailiff just because of the draft and everything going on right now. But I definitely think Connor Ferris has the faster go-kart and, uh, and should be able to get around Gavin Bailiff as soon as he wants to. Because, oh, and Connor Ferris hangs a tire there and almost spins out coming out of the last corner. That was close, and you do not want to do that, especially where he is right now. Yeah, I mean, he dropped a tire, and again, one of the worst places to do so. So uh, as they uh, come out of the I-70 hairpin here this time, he's able to close that back up. But we saw that in the pre-final as well here. He'd get going and would just make one little mistake, but he's got so much speed you can tell he's running on the ragged edge. I mean, that Car Republic chassis is known for, you know, still being able to be pretty free and, uh, and not really have much of an understeer when the grip comes down. We're on a racetrack here that maybe has a little bit of rubber laid down, but after the torrential downpour, you can't imagine there's a whole lot of grip built into the racetrack here based on uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah, and our times from yesterday are way slower as well. We were in the low 112s yesterday, and we're not even in the 12-second bracket yet today. So definitely off pace is the track, um, but that, that's not for Connor Ferris, though. He is fast right now, and he is right on the leader right. Um, but he has no pressure from behind, and I think he's just going to sit there, keep his tires cool, and, uh, and try and get those laps wound down until he can finally make a move and, and try and maybe pull away from Gavin Bailiff later in this race. We still have about six and a half minutes until we get those two to go. Yeah, a little bit of time. There's a bobble that time from Gavin Bailiff as he came out of the final corner. Here comes Connor Ferris, so one lap removed. Bailiff makes the mistake of dropping the wheel off the last turn. And Connor Ferris commands the field for the first time today in the main event. Yeah, impressive from him. He's been fast and caught up to Gavin Bailiff, took two or three laps just to keep his stuff cool. And then now he's back out front and is going to push for a few laps and see if maybe he can get a gap from the rest of the field and Gavin Bailiff. Yeah, so we'll see. You can see the, uh, the countdown timer. We've gotten in the top right-hand uh, right corner of the screen. Just about six minutes remaining here in this one, plus two laps for the main. Each lap is about a minute 15, so you get a little bit less than six laps, closer to five plus two. So we're looking at roughly seven to go. Six laps already completed, so you have to think we're just about halfway. This is about the point, like you said, Connor, your cart should already be about as good as it'll get, or maybe just 
getting close to that sweet spot depending where you set your pressures and uh, how hard or easy you drove in those early few laps. You know, there's something to manipulate, obviously, the race and, you know, how your tire temperature is really not so much tire degradation in the middle of these sessions, right? When you get to a certain point, you can ride behind someone, let the draft keep you close, cool your tires off. So when you get in front like Connor Ferris, like you said, you can dig hard and try to build that gap away. But we're not seeing it happen too much. That toe is keeping Gavin Bailiff right there, keeping Connor honest as they head for the I-70 corner and now out of it towards turn three. Yeah, definitely got to keep those temps down. You can't let them get too hot, especially since we've been running these tires since qualifying. They are definitely not, not, not at their peak right now. So having the, as much grip as you can is, uh, is what you got to do, and you got to keep those tire temps down and, and keep the grip in the go-kart. You can't get them too hot too early, or else you're going to struggle at the end of this race. As you see many of the mid-pack mid drivers like struggling to get grip and, and a lot of battling going on for this mid-pack. Yeah, we'll focus on that here in just a moment as your leaders head on through over to the cell tower and see what other battles we can pick up on. Again, we mentioned Keegan Bosch going by Chase Jones. Things have kind of subsided a bit there for the fifth and sixth, but Jones still having a good battle back with Adam Maxwell, DeChesser, and Jonah Hanran. That's uh, Ethan O'Ring in the shot. He's on the outside of the top ten looking in, I believe. Has gone by on Jonah Hanran, so Hanran to 11th, uh, O'Ring to 10th, and you can see that group they, it's four of them in the frame, but there's some go-karts that are peeking their nose into frame as well right behind them. So your leader's just coming across the start-finish line now. Here's this group coming into the final three corners, led by uh, O-Ring on the Brandon Jarsacrack Racing, Full Tilt Racing OTK, then Hanran, then right behind Hanran, we'll find uh, in 12th, Mick Gabriel, who's at, he's at an up-and-down topsy-turvy day, and Danny Dazelski's in that group as well, who is uh, the quickest driver on the racetrack. Yeah, Danny Dashelski started a little bit further back than he had hoped so. Um, he had some bad luck in the first heat race that took him out of that and put him at the back of the pre-final, and he's just had to claw his way through the field. But he's fast. I mean, he has the fastest lap time of the race. As you see him go to the inside right there, he is making his way up the, up the field, and uh, he's running out of time, though. He's going to need to hurry up if he wants to get into that top ten, which I think he should be able to as long as he can get by these next three go-karts. Yeah, he should have uh, at least enough laps probably to crack the top ten. You can see Ethan O'Ring holding the tenth spot. That midfield group, they're still pretty tightly packed. Just out of frame, just going was third and fourth. That was, again, Finn Bailiff and Nikita Panaris. Haven't uh, talked too much about how good of a run this has been for the career of Nikita Panaris because he has been phenomenal all weekend as your leaders come out of the final turn. We've seen a change in the lead while we were looking backwards. Gavin Bailiff has gone back to the point. Connor Ferris down to second. Um, and it looks like they may stay that way here for the time being. Nine laps completed. Three minutes plus two laps to go, more or less. So there go your two leaders into the Monza section. Gavin Bailiff, Connor Ferris, just they're feeling each other out, right? When you get the time to ride behind someone for a couple laps and you're mostly evenly matched, you can see if maybe on their setup, on their gearing, if they're going to be a little bit stronger than you or a little bit worse than you uh, in certain sectors of the racetrack. And that's, of course, information you pocket for those last two laps of the race. Because at this point, I think they both know outside of a major catastrophe, more than likely a mechanical failure would be all that would take them out. It's going to come down to these two. Neither one's going to get away. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be between the two of them come two laps to go. As you see Connor Ferris riding right behind Gavin Bailiff. And that's what I'd be doing if I was Connor. Um, got that Connor telepathy. Yep. And uh, he's definitely kind of watching what Gavin's doing, seeing where he's a little quicker, seeing where he's a little slower. So when two laps to go comes around, he knows where to pass. And he wants to pass right before his quick spot to see if he can kind of get himself a little bit of a gap right there. Um, but yeah, he's uh, starting to close in on about three or four laps to go, four laps to go, I think it is, in this race. So it's about time for Connor Ferris to start getting anxious, and he might want to start making a move towards the lead here shortly. Well, there goes the rest of the group on through the pack. That was third, fourth, and fifth. Here's the back half of the top ten, all coming by the start-finish line front straight away. We'll pick your leaders back up. Going into the Monza, still single file for the lead. Mick Gabriel, now the new quickest driver, up 21 positions. We talked about Gabriel in the pre-final getting taken out early on uh, and now he's having to work his way forward we've got some more drivers further back just ahead of him starting to battle as he has at least worked his way out of this crazy group we were following earlier that was uh, battling for the top 10 with the likes of Ethan O-Ring to Cesaro Dizelski's in that pack still a little bit he's gotten to 11th but Mick Gabriel's gotten some clear racetrack got about a second gap out back he's caught up to Adam Maxwell think he might he might have even gone by him already 
Uh, yeah, it does look like he's gone around Adam Maxwell and already pulled a good bat, good la good gap out um, in front of him. And he's working on Chase Jones now. He's got about four or five cart lengths um, between him and Chase Jones. And Chase Jones passing Hunter Perry right now. Uh, but as we look at our leaders coming across the line, Gavin Bailiff got a little bit of a gap. He looks back, sees that. We got about three laps to go as we come by this this time. So there's Finn Bailiff looking like he's coming by the line. And look at that. Gavin Bailiff, now your new quickest driver. He resets the fast time of the session uh, on your screen. That was uh, Mick Gabriel. He's looking for a way by on Hunter Perry. Has caught up to Chase Jones. And there's nothing more demoralizing here, especially, I'm sure, for Chase Jones a little bit, or at least deflating then running up front all weekend long. And then you get a guy like Mick Gabriel, who he's a oh, little bit of sportsmanship there, got into him, we gave him the spot back. Um, but catching you from dead last, or essentially dead last. Again, he uh, was scored a 30th place result in that pre-final as he works for the rear bumper at Hunter Perry. Doesn't go by him just yet. But Gabriel to come from all the way back from 30th, catch Chase Jones, who's still running good. He's running sixth right now, was running inside the top three, nearly won a few of those heat races. To see someone start from last and catch you, I mean, that that's hurts. You know, that that's a punch in the ego. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And I remember coming from the back a lot. And when I come into the scales after having a good run, people ask me, man, when I saw you on the third lap up front, I was, I just felt terrible. And as you can see here, Mick Gabriel got past uh, the two of them. And he is working on Chase Jones now. But he's got a good gap to go to get to Chase Jones. But as the leaders come by the stripe, two laps to go. Connor Ferris is right here on Finnegan ba or Gavin Bailiff as they come down towards the Monza. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a fight between the two of them, really, right, Xander? Yeah, I mean, we've only got we've got a near six-second margin back to Finn Bailiff. Bailiff, Finnegan Bailiff. It looked like for a minute was going to be pulling away from uh, Nikita Panaris, but ultimately Panaris has closed that gap back up. So this will be the battle for the lead and the win. They could block, they could low line, they could darn near wreck each other, and it wouldn't matter in the grand scheme of things. They've got that big of a margin back on the rest of the pack with two laps to go. The timer has counted down. We'll see the white flag this time. Win. Does Connor Ferris pull the trigger? You can see Gavin Bailiff starting to block in the cell tower when he shoots down to the inside. And again, that defensive driving, that's going to be this whole last lap here. This is what they've all been building towards. Who and K Stars will come out as king of the castle a lap and a quarter to go. Yeah, Connor Ferris needs to start thinking about making a move here shortly. Gavin Bailiff is going to start defending his line, and he's going to make it hard on Connor Ferris to get around him. And as you can tell, Gavin Bailiff already starting to defend as they come to get the white flag. One lap to go here for the KA Stars. It's a battle between Gavin Bailiff and Connor Ferris as they go down into turn one. Gavin Bailiff goes to the inside, Connor Ferris to the outside. Can he go around the outside? No, he's going to try and get the crossover. Not going to happen. Gavin Bailiff pushes him out. Oh, they can make contact. That was a little bit sketchy right there as Gavin Bailiff goes through the Monza. Yeah, he definitely pushed him out all right. Connor Ferris c crossed him over, and Gavin Bailiff did not want to give him the inside for turn four, that Monza corner. Now through the red 171 hairpin, he's got a little bit of a gap. He can run a normal line. Connor Ferris is going to have a shot at him in the cell tower. And then the final sector, which has produced such great racing action all weekend long. We'll keep it tight as we can here on the fight for the win. To the cell tower. Bailiff to the inside one more time. Yeah, Bailiff still protecting his line, not letting Connor Ferris get to the inside of him. As you can see, Connor Ferris trying everything inside, outside. Nothing is working. Gavin Bailiff protecting so well. As you see him go to the bottom right here, looking back, seeing where Connor Ferris is. Not going to block Whoa! enough. He's going to go to the inside. They're going to be side by side. And he drops a wheel. They're still side by side. Ferris around the outside gets clear. Connor Ferris with three corners to go. Takes the lead and takes the win in King of the Castle for KA Stars. That was a good one right there. He, uh, I mean, he found the space on the inside that Gavin left for him, and, and he took it, and that's what it's going to take to take a win here at, at the Stars. Yeah, I mean, that was all the way to the very end, and had Gavin Bailiff not gone just about a couple inches too wide as we're seeing a mad gaggle of carts come across the line, I mean, just a hair wide there, and all of a sudden, we've talked about it before here at Newcastle, the grass, the way the pavement ends, it drops off, and so you just get to the edge, and then the tire touches the grass, and it wants to go down that hill, and it pulled him halfway off the racetrack, and that was all the momentum break that Connor Ferris needed to get clear. On the outside in the grid corner, a fantastic finish for KA Stars. Let's take you through the rest of the finishing order, because again, there was a lot of notable storylines that came out of that one here. First and foremost, of course, Connor Ferris wins out over Gavin Bailiff. Finnegan Bailiff ends up in third on the box. Eight spots gained, sets his best lap of the session on the final lap. 
pulling away from Nikita Panaris in fourth. Deegan Bosch rounding out the top five. Last year's runner up in the championship kicks off his 2022 campaign with a nice points run. Much better, unfortunately, than that of Tyler Wettengel, who got taken out in the first quarter. Chase Jones ends up six and 23 spots gained for Mick Gabriel and nearly got to Jones there by the end. Seven tenths back, he ends seven. Hunter Perry picks up 11 spots to eight. Dzelski drives through the field after he started decent, was uh, starting around 11th or 12th, uh, but after that first quarter wreck, as you can see on the screen, lots of cards he picked up, he ends up in the ninth position. So again, that rounds out the field with DeCessero in 10th. PJ Lida also big time mover, came out of uh, the back of the grid. I think he came out of the LCQ. Yeah, he did come out of the LCQ, he had a good run, and the LCQ was one of the fastest parts, and he was able to make the as well, which is a good run for him after some rough heat races. Yeah, again, we talked again about some of the drivers that unfortunately did not have the best of main events. You talk about the major names taken out in that first corner, Tyler Wettengel, Elliot, Elliot Budzinski, yeah. I mean, quite a few here, but hey, it's Stars Championship Series race in action. Everyone's trying to find a place to watch it. There's Parker DeLong and company and Josh Conker. They're getting ready to go. In fact, there's more racing coming your way. Stick with us, folks. Car Chasers coverage of King of the Castle here for round one of the Stars Championship Series rolls on. I'm Billy Vincent, owner of MPG Motorsports. What we do at MPG is we try to keep it a, a nice, fun family atmosphere. Uh, try to combine sort of the, the bigger things and the, of the bigger teams and the professionalism down with sort of some of the fun sort of family-oriented uh, atmosphere. We try to not only develop drivers, but also the parents and the families um, for just the knowledge in general in motorsports. It all starts in karting. What we try to do is, is try to help the drivers, the moms, the dads understand the sport of motorsports in general, not just karting, but what it takes to get all the way up through. Uh, whether you end up wanting to be a driver or a mechanic or an engineer, you know, we can help you with that, and that's what we're here for. If you're interested in joining us at MPG, our home base is at Whiteland Raceway Park in Indianapolis, and you can contact us at info at willpowercart.com, and one of our great people will reach out to you, and, and we'll try to put the best program together. Odenthal Racing Products, your number one producer in engine mounts since 1992, along with our leading edge designs and product development, such as the Odenthal Racing Products Easy GP Camera Mount, which comes in four different styles and can be used on any karting platform. To see our products online, go to odenthalracing.com.
Micro Swift rolling out on track here for their main event on pole position. It was a last lap pass to get the win, and it will be the number 75 of Holden Harder on pole. First time running up there, super impressive from him. A last lap pass with three corners to go around Cameron Marsha got him the win. So he is going to be starting on pole position alongside of Cameron Marsha with Marco Samat starting in third. Obviously, that pre-final that we just saw was one of the most exciting pre-finals with upwards of six and seven cards in the league group. Obviously, you had Holden Harder. You had Caleb Tarry who's going to be coming back through the field after an issue in the pre-final. I believe he had his exhaust potentially come off. That was one of the stranger DNFs that we've seen in recent memory, but still, it's a very deep Microsoft field. He's going to have issues going through the field. He's going to have to get be efficient with his move. And certainly, I mean, this is a field with 26 cards in it, a lot of depth, a lot of fast cards, including guys like Kai Mars, AJ Stoner, who had really a troublesome weekend all the way until the pre-final where he put together a good run. He'll be starting up towards the front of this field alongside guys like Kai Mars. Obviously, though, taking you through the order, we, got, we have Holden Harder starting on pole position. Alongside him will be Cameron Marsha. In second row, you have Kai Mars and uh, Marco Samut. You have a third row start starting position with with AJ Stoner, and I believe that is that would be uh, Adam Woolridge starting on the outside of the third row. Um, getting ready to take the green here. We got Holden Harder taking him slow down through the last two corners here. Getting ready to go green. Uh, should be an exciting main event. We had a lot of, of action in the, all the heat races and the pre-final. The whole field was always super tight. So I'm really looking forward to watching these kids go after it in this, in this main event. Yeah. We roll into the tram lines here. Got Holden Harder on the pole. Cameron Marsha outside of him. They're already on the gas. The lights are still on. And we are green. Not yet. We are green now. We're racing into turn one. Goes Holden Harder. Look at the jump that he was able to get. Has already has like a two car length gap to back to Cameron Marsh, and Cameron Marsh is able to slot into second as the rest of the field comes through. Uh, Kai Mars slots into third already. Marco Samet trying to make some moves to get himself up into the fourth position past AJ Stoner, but the two leaders already stretching away from the rest of the field. Yeah, and so far it looks like a clean sailing for Holden Harder. He did not lead many laps throughout the weekend, I believe, only led one or two in the pre-final, but he led the ones that counted to get the pole position for this race. Cameron Marsha into P2. He had nearly a, a pole position for this one by winning the pre-final, but certainly a really good race for him. And then over the course over the course of the weekend, we've seen Cameron Marsha go from being outside the top five to ultimately being up at the front of the field. And so it's a good start for him being in P2. In P1, in P1 you also have... Holden Harder continuing to go along and have a really good race so far. He's been up at the front. We'll see how he does leading the race. A bit different from his role earlier in the, on in the weekend where in the pre-final he was outside the top five. But still a good start for him. Marco Samo is leading the second group in P3. He's about a second or so behind him. And then you've got AJ Stone sort of behind him in P4. He's had a pretty good start and clean. And considering his first two heats, that's about all you can ask for for him. Down the line, you've also got Kai Mars in P5, Adam Woolridge in P6. Those are your top six. All of them kind of close together, especially the top two, and then a little bit of a gap through third through six. As you see some action coming into turn one, looks like Marcus was able to keep a position. Kai Mars tried, I believe, and he got by AJ Stoner for P4, and then you've got Woolridge in P6 as well. So those three are right there together. We'll see if Stoner's going to work with Kai Mars or just try to pass back. But as an exit of the scoreboard, you can see Holder, Holden Harder is right at the front, but he's got Marsha right behind him. Willing to work with him so far, but we'll see how long that lasts as Marco Samut continues to work towards the front. Yeah, you can see Marco Samet really fast right now, running down these leaders really quick. He was nine-tenths of a second behind them at the start of the lap, and he's probably only three-tenths behind them right now. So he's going to be able to, to get up to Cameron Marsha's bumper real soon. And if Cameron Marsha doesn't make a move for the lead on Holden Harder, then Marco Samet's going to get around him. So he needs to make a move quick before the rest of the field catches up. Yeah, and obviously Samet's had a lot of speed all weekend. One of the heat races was fast in every single session. He's been able to catch up to those front two and really has kind of put some distance between himself and Kai Mars, although Mars looks pretty quick on this lap. And they're bo both him and A.J. Stoner are kind of dropping Adam Woolridge in P6. But at the moment, purple lap for Kai Mars with a 119.7. That is a full eight-tenths of a second quicker than what we saw the top two in Holden Harder and Cameron Marsha do. 
So you have to think as Marsha goes for the lead coming through I-70, gets the position, he's going to take the lead now ahead of Marco Sama. And then, I, and then Holden Harder was able to slide back into P3 after getting passed for the lead in P2. Now, though, it's a six-car train at the front. Kai Mars is next up on the list, and he's going to pass Harder coming into the scoreboard. So in one lap, Harder's gone all the way down from P1 to P4. He's lost control of this race, and now he's back where he was in the pre-final. But now it's Cameron Marsha, the guy who looked back about 14 times in the span of one lap for in the first time he led. This time he looks a little bit more calm, a little bit earlier on in the race, so it's easier for him to just put down some laps. We'll see how he feels going, coming now as it's a six-cart train from first to six led by Cameron Marsha. Yeah, I'm watching Marco Samet here as he's running down Cameron Marsha. He's been super fast this whole main event, coached by Brandon Jarsakrak and Pauly Massimino, two of some of the best drivers in the country helping him. And it's showing right now as he's running down Cameron Marsha into the lead. Here comes Marco Samet. He's going to try and make a move here shortly to get by Cameron Marsha. But Cameron Marsha is holding strong. Even with the draft, he's starting to gap himself a little bit from the rest of the field. So we'll see as he comes down on the front straighter, takes a look over his shoulder and sees that he's got a little bit of a gap, taps on his helmet, tells Marco Samet to push him. Let's try and get away from the rest of the field here. As Marco Samet does not listen, straight to the inside he goes. Cameron Marsha back to fourth, back to third. And that's unfortunate for him as he lost three spots already. And already Adam Woolridge taking it again too. So that's first to fifth in the matter of two corners. And I, like I tell you, if every time I see someone look back, I take advantage of it right away because I know that they are worried about what's behind them. And Marco Samet did exactly that. And now Kai Mars to the lead in the red 171 hairpin. This race is getting exciting right now. Yeah, I wish I had learned earlier in my career not to look back so much, but it is what it is. I'm sure that's a lesson that Cameron Marsh is going to learn pretty quickly as he looked back and immediately got passed by three cards coming into turn one, made, made it forward coming into Monza. And now, though, Kai Mars is back into the lead after he passed Marco Samet coming through the scoreboard corner. Obviously, this has been a really good weekend for Kai Mars. Again, uh, the Trinity Karting Group guy, one of the fastest guys on the grid throughout the weekend. He won one of the heat races. He's up front. Marco Samet seems content to push him for the moment, but we'll see how that evolves. Holden Hortis work has worked his way back up into P3, and he seems to have the pace now that he has someone to chase in terms of being able to be in third. We saw when he was leading, he was running a little bit slower than the other guys in the group. Now, though, figured things out. He's working with Samet, who seems to be willing to work with Myers, although as I say that, looks like Samet's going to go to the lead coming down the front straightaway. Harder's going to push him through. Samet up to the lead again as he exits I-70. And again, we have Marco Samet, who's probably spent the most time at anyone out front this weekend, making another round as the leader. Those three are still have a little bit of a gap now. Back to Cameron Marshall. Worked his way back by Woolridge on the backside of the course. He's in P4 now, and we'll see. He's had a lot of pace this weekend, but unless, unless they can work together, it might be the top three. But at the moment, it looks like Cameron Marsh has been able to call back a little bit of gap even on the first part of this lap, and he's bringing Woolridge and A.J. Stoner with him as well. Yeah, A.J. Stoner qualified pole earlier in the weekend, and he's been fast, but he's been lacking a little bit of racecraft, just a little bit of some rookie mistakes from him. But he's there right now. He's on the tail end of that six-car train as Cameron Marsh has caught up to the leaders, although he just missed that corner right there, the cell tower. But Marco Samet taking control of this race, holding harder, following him in second, working together. Kai Mars in third, Cameron Marsha fourth, and Adam Woolridge rounding out your top five right now. We got, uh, that looks like Christopher Yautzi trying to run them down in sixth or seventh, and he's a little bit behind that lead pack, but he's got some work to do to try and get up there, but they are battling hard at the front right now, so we will see him there quite soon if this continues. Yeah, and it looks like, Sam, it looks like he has a lot of pace at the lead right now, doing a 119.7. The moment that looks to be the quickest time on the track. You see now going into turn one, look at a move by Marsha on the inside of Kai Mars. Marsh tried to defend, did not defend enough. And what a move by Cameron Marsha, throwing absolute haymakers out there, getting himself up to P3. We've seen him come through the field once in the pre-final to get himself up to the lead before losing it eventually. Now we're seeing him work back through the field. He's gone from P1 to P5, now back to P3, and now he's going to get passed again in the scoreboard by Kai Mars. Kai Mars does not want to work with people, it seems. In terms of being the pusher, he wants to lead that group, and that group is currently just trying to shuffle things out. But at the moment, they've lost the lead group, the lead two now, with Harder and Sam having about a five cart, four or five cart length lead over the two, over the third through six guys. Yeah, that was not very smart from Kai Mars. As as soon as he passed him back, the leaders started to gap him. But we'll see if it works out in his favor as he's starting to run back down those top two. 
as Marco Samet still leading this race. Super consistent lap times from him. He's in the high 19s every single lap. But Kai Mars fast time is at 19.3. So he's going to need some pace if he wants to try to check out from the rest of this field. As you see, he's really fast through the tight stuff here as he always gets a little bit of a gap before they get to the straightaway. But still, super close racing between the top six here. And Christopher Yautzi still trying to get onto that tail end of that field, but he is just not fast enough. Yeah, and at the moment, they're all just kind of drafting together. That makes it difficult. You can tell Marco Sema just continues to be extremely consistent. And, I mean, this is something that you really can see the benefits of driver coaching and having a good team behind you. Obviously, working with Brandon Dreschkrack, working with Pauli Mascuno, two guys that know what they're doing, that have a lot of experience leading races. You can see that kind of playing itself out here. So he's not uncomfortable in the slides. As Kai Morris makes a move to go down the inside to go to P2 through the score, that seems to be his corner. He seems to really want to make moves there. And now it's going to put Holden Harder vulnerable to even more trouble. As now Cameron Marsh has gone for P3, coming through green corner. AJ Sutter's going to try down the inside. It looks like he tried doing the kink, and that's going to cause him to lose a position to Adam Woolridge coming into the cell tower. So this is all kicking off now behind Marco Samo, who just continues to click off laps. Kai Mars has a lot of pace in that car. You can tell by the fact that he keeps gapping that group behind him and catching Samet. If he can ever put together a lap where he's not passing people on the scoreboard. I feel like he's going to be right on Samet because he clearly th seems to have the best pace of anyone early on in this race. But Samet's just keeping a cool head, keeping it consistent, has not made many mistakes. And he's just leading this group and not doing anything too out of control. So it's paying off for him. Yeah, Marco Samet takes a look over his shoulder before completing his seventh lap. He is still leading here in Newcastle with sunny skies and a little bit of clouds in the sky. But still, oh, there goes Kai Mars right as I say that. Right as I say that, Kai Mars tries to go to the inside, but Marco Samet does not let it happen. Marco Samet wants to be in the lead of this race as Cameron Marsha comes through for second place. We'll see if Kai Mars will be willing to work with him now as they go and try and chase down the leader of Marcus, Marco Samet. As they go to the red 171 hairpin right now, Marco Samet has about a four cart length gap from Cameron Marsha and Kai Mars. Kai Mars right up next to Cameron Marsha. We'll see if he'll be able to get around him or if he's going to try and work with him to catch up to the leader here. Yeah, Marsh has had a lot of pace as well. We've seen him work all the way back from fifth now, back up to second. Sam continues to just control the race at the front. He's not really doing anything spectacular from a pace standpoint. But it seems like the rest of the group just cannot decide when they want to make that pass. And we've seen Kai Mars try it. We've seen Cameron Marsha try it. We've seen Holden Harder at the beginning of the race try it. But Sam has been the only one to consistently be able to hold the lead for more than a lap or two. And he's doing a good job of it, too. I mean, he's got Marsha right at his toe. Obviously, it looks like at this point, Mars and Marsha both seem to have a little bit of a pace advantage. But still, Sam is just running his race, running extremely consistently. And so far, no one else has been able to say that in the lead. And so we'll see. I would expect here Cameron Marsh to possibly make a move coming into turn one. But still, we'll have to see what happens here. But certainly, it's been a good race so far for Sam. And at the moment, it looks like maybe Marsh is content to stay in line. He's going to stay there all the way down the straightaway. So... For once, we get a lap where no one tries to make a move into turn one. Although, as I say that, A.J. Stoner goes wide coming out of the I-70 corner. It looks like he's lost about three cart lengths, and that might be a really critical mistake for him. Although, as I say that, he's right back in line. Adam Ward is going to try to get back as he cr as Stoner climbs the curve again. Now, Marsha goes defensive on, on Kai Mars coming into the scoreboard. He's seen what Mars has done the last few laps and continues to block. And that is going to allow for Samus to get a gap again in this race. Yeah, Marco Samet has just had all the speed in the world to stay out front. Uh, I think some of the drivers behind him have the pace, but they are just not working well enough together to get up there. As you see, they try and get past him, and then they have an issue, and they either start blocking or start passing for second, second place. And I've seen a lot of this happen at this track, such as in X30 Junior, back when I raced here in USPKS. A lot of people, I'd, I would get to the lead, and then they would just battle for second behind me, and I was able to pull away. And it kind of looks like what Marco Samet's doing right here He's just leading the race, controlling it. Every time he gets past, he always takes that opportunity and goes right back to the lead. And you can see it's working out for him right now as he is leading the whole race so far. And there are only two minutes and less left to go until we get that two to go sign. And you'll see Kai Mars. Kai Mars going to the inside for second place again. What is going on here? And he's going to go gonna, for the lead too, right, right lead there. And he back. takes it. He he's takes it. it from Kai Mars. Kai Mars takes the lead from Marco Samet. And that's going to be the first time that Marco Samet has seen that bumper in front of him. Yeah, now Kaimar is back to the front. You've got Marco Samet right on his tail. We'll see how patient he is. Obviously, in this track, you do not want to be anywhere outside of the top two. So it's been really Mars and Samet have been the two most assertive in terms of staying in their position. Holden Harder's worked his way back up into third right position. Right there, you see Marco Samet going straight back into the lead. 
He does not want to be in second place right now as they catch this lap traffic. Will they be able to get around it smoothly? We'll see here shortly. And Marco Sam is still in the lead as they head into the cell tower corner. They're going to go to the inside of the lap car and they're going to get through clean. Oh, that lap car did not want to give that up as Cameron Marsha goes to the tail end of that six cart train for the lead. This is an amazing race. All six of these drivers have been driving their tails off all race long and they are going all over the place with positions all up and down as AJ Stoner is slowly clawing his way up into the top three here. As you can see, he's in fourth with his white helmet, the second white helmet in the front train. And s coming around here to see three laps to go. 45 seconds left on the clock. Marco Samet knows it. He takes a look back, sees that they're right there. He's going to keep in touch, and he's going to, oh, nope, he's not going to defend. Not going to defend enough as Kai Mars goes to the lead, and Holden Harder follows him through. Kai Mars straight back to the lead. Kai Mars will not push anyone this race. Yeah, I think Mars has been probably the most assertive guy out there, and it's worked out for him so far. He's into the lead. We'll see if Holden Harder, who seems to be a little bit more reserved, a little bit more willing to follow, and maybe a little bit more comfortable in that second position. We'll see if he's willing to stay behind him, but certainly Kai Mars has been really assertive in this race. It's worked out for him. You see Marco Sima as low as he's been really all race in third place, and we'll see if he's going to try to change that pretty soon. Certainly he's got the pace to run up with those front two, and really, I mean, anyone in that top six has the potential to win this race. You've got so many fast cars here. They're all so evenly matched. And really, I mean, even at the back of the group, guys like AJ Sonner is in fourth place right now. Like his racecraft might be, might not be quite where a guy like Kai Mars might not be quite as aggressive as what Mars has been able to do. But still, he's got the pace to be up there. And with the way this race has gone and as much of a lottery it is, it is really working out as we're getting set to come to two laps to go. Now you're certainly going to see someone like Kai Mars be really aggressive here in defense. Just because, I mean, you do not want to lose track position around here. We've seen in this race, once you get to the lead, anything else is fair game from second on back. And so it's going to be an interesting finish. We'll see if Harder's going to continue to be patient and try to push Mars or if he's going to try to get the lead himself coming to two to go. And you can see him there straight to the inside. He goes as soon as he got the sticks in the air, the double sticks, he goes to the inside. Marco Samet's going to fall. He's going to go for the lead. Two for one in one corner. There you go. Marco Samet straight to the lead as he takes over the lead going down the hill and into the Monza. You can see AJ Stoner trying to slide into third as he is going to give it up for Holden Harder. You can see Cameron Marsha back there. Where did Adam Woolridge go? What happened to Adam Woolridge? We lost him. We're down to five now. Unfortunate for him, but that is going to happen. I'm not sure where Adam Woolridge is. What is happening here? Wow. Well, we're down to five carts still, and Marco Samet's going to lead this train as Kai Mars follows Holden Harder, AJ Stoner, and Cameron Marsha at the tail end of that field. And Marsh is going to have a lot of work to do. He's kind of found himself in the worst position possible being at the back of that group. But Marco Sam, again, the really aggressive move in turn one to get two guys in one go, to be able to get the lead back. Now we can control the race coming to the last lap. You've got the two most aggressive drivers in first and second in Kai Mars and Marco Sam. This is kind of the guys that we kind of expected to be sort of the initiators of this battle. And now we'll see how it plays out with now Sam. Got a little bit of a gap on Mars, but still nowhere near enough to feel comfortable. As they come to the line, it's going to be five carts all under a blanket, line, all lined up. Who's it going to be coming to the white flag? You see Sam tries to go defensive. It looks like he's been able to cover them all successfully. Everyone goes down to the bottom. And now as they come into turn one, it looks like Mars is going to try to go even further. Oh, Mars puts Mars the bumper to him and moves Marco Samet out of the way, but it's not going to be enough to get around him as Marco Samet's still leading this race. He's not even going to defend into the Monza. Kai Mars is right there. We got one lap to go here. About nine corners left on the circuit. Kai Mars, gonna, he's not even going to defend. He's going to try rolling the outside. Will he be able to make Whoa. it with stick? Oh, they're that side by close. side. He gave it, he, a lot of respect there from Kai Mars. I'm not sure if I would have been... Uh, nice enough to leave the space there on the last lap after trying to hold the outside. Marco Samet still leading down through the kink, up the hill, going into the cell tower here. This is one of the last opportunities for a pass as Kai Mars stays in line. No passes yet from them as Cameron Marsha trails this field. Holden Harder staying in third. AJ Stoner staying in fourth. No changes in the top five yet in this lap. We'll see if there will be any changes as we go around the blue corner, down the hill. We got three, four corners to go. Kaimar is going to block for second. I'm not sure they're going to be able to make it happen as Marco Samet has about a two cart length gap. Three corners to go. Two corners to go. Marco Samet still leading with Kaimar's just behind. And they are not going to be able to do anything as Marco Samet will take the win here at the King of the Castle in Micro Swift. What a race from all five of those drivers. And 
Wow. What do you got to think about that one, Emery? That was a crazy race. I mean, Kai Mars was really aggressive all the way up until the end. Marco Sama did a fantastic job keeping the track position. Never fell outside the top three. Continued. Ended up, started the race in six. That was the lowest he got. Led a lot of laps in that one. And certainly, well-deserved win for Marco Sama for all... All of the speed he had all weekend, the amount of racecraft he showed, really good showing from him. Kai Mars ends up second from seventh on the grid, a good showing from him as well. Holden Harder rounds out your podium, and again, like considering the fact that he struggled early on in the race to lead the race, ending up on the podium with some good pace has to be a happy feeling for Holden Harder. Then beyond that, you've got AJ Stoner, your pole sitter for this week in MP4. Cameron Marsha comes home in fifth after running in the top three for most of this race. Then you've got Christopher Yassay as well, who kind of had a little bit of a rough weekend after starting on the front row. Grady Chronic in P7, Caleb Tarter in P8, obviously rebounding from a rough pre-final for him. Danny O'Gara in P9, and rounding out your ten, top 10 is Enzo DJ in a row. Yeah, that was an interesting race to say the least. Um, I'd be super proud if I were any five of those drivers, knowing that you had the chance to win. You're going to learn, and you're either going to win or you're going to learn. And I'm sure that most of those kids know what they could have done differently to win that race, except for Marco Samet, who got the job done, led most laps, and just stayed out front, and it really worked out for him. And we got a lot more racing left to come. And keep watching. We're going to be on Car Chaser. Let's go to a commercial break. Got one driver off the track here. We got Master Shifter Racing coming up next. Uh, unfortunate for that driver to see that happen for him. But we are going to get racing here. This time by standing start Formula One style. Um, Joe Rook and Evan Bat have been putting on a show in this class so far this weekend. We'll see if they can continue to do that here right now. Yeah, I mean, Rook has been able to get the whole shot on multiple occasions. It looks like Bat has had the faster cart at times. Obviously, it looks like he's probably the favorite, I would say, to win, although Rucket gets to start on pole for this one. So certainly, the way this has worked out, it's going to be a really exciting race between the two of them. We've seen them play battle all weekend long so far. And then Jason Campbell in third as well really came on strong in the last race, had a lot of pace to match what those two were doing. So if he could get a good start and possibly get in between them, he could play a good role in this one in this one as well. As Looking down the rest of the top 10, you've got Rod Clenard in P4. Row 3 is going to consist of Scott Presti and Justin Kelly. Row 4 is Robert Peach and Chris Jennings. And row 5 is going to be Jeff Mills and Brad Dan Dandolph. And of those, the first guy on the Rockmasters is Rod Clenard in P4 and Chris Jennings in P8. But really, the battle that we're all looking for, Joe Ruck, Evan Bat, and Jason Campbell, it's going to be an exciting one as everyone's formed up for the start. Last three people get, getting into their grid spots. Looks like everyone's going to be a go. 
get ready for the starting sequence. Here we go. And here we go. It is one light, two light, three lights, four lights. Lights out. We're away. As we go into turn one, it looks like Joe Ruck gets the whole shot right away. Comes across to cover off Evan Bat into P3 as well. I believe it's Jason Campbell. So all three of your top three have made it through cleanly. Behind them, it's a little bit more chaotic, but certainly the top two got away really well in Joe Ruck and Evan Bat. Ruck gets the whole shot yet again. I believe that's three times in four races for him this weekend. And so Ruck will lead them away coming down into the scoreboard hairpin. You can already see a battle back in further back through the field. I believe that might be round P7 or so. Maybe like Chris Jennings and Robert Peach. Certainly a really, t really close racing between the two. Meanwhile, at the front, though, Ruck has been able to get about a cart length or so gap to him between himself and Evan Bat. But as they come down Seltar, that's going to continue to close. Then it's a pretty decent size gap back to Jason Campbell. And we'll have to see if he has the pace to keep up with those front two. Yeah, another good start from, from Ruck. He's had an awesome, uh, he's had a couple of awesome hole shots, honestly, this weekend. Um, keeping it out front in those first few laps and then just kind of trying to manage the race, kind of like what we saw from Marco Samet last, last race in the Micro Swift division. Just kind of trying to stay out front and make, make it happen, really. He might not be the fastest, but he's going to keep it out front and not let Evan Bat get in front of him. And that's what he's doing right now. He misses a few corners, but he's going to defend his line and keep it out in front. Yeah, and it looks like, looked like Ruck was a little bit slow out of the last corners. Now Evan Back goes to the race lead coming through I-70, gets the position. He's got it cleanly. Now we'll see if Ruck can fight back. He's a little bit too far coming into Monza. So Evan Bat wasted no time there. And now that brings the rest of the field right back onto their, ta onto their tail. Jason Campbell is now up into P3. He's right behind the front two, obviously. Ruck, though, kind of maybe made a little bit of a mistake in the last corner. Don't know if the cart's still coming in. Obviously, the tire's going to be a little bit cold. Certainly not the greatest of first laps for Ruck, even though he got the whole shot. And now you can see he's struggling to keep up with Evan Bat. I don't know if there's a problem or maybe if tires haven't come in yet or if he's just simply struggling with the handling. But regardless, this has not been a good start for Joe Ruck. And as every corner goes by and he lose, loses more and more time, that's more and more time that if he has to make that back up over the course of the race, that's even more of a mountain to climb as now Evan Back gets to do kind of whatever he wants and can control the race from the front now. Yeah, a really good start here from Evan Bat as he has about a second lead now from Joe Ruck. Joe Ruck has made a, f a lot of mistakes on this first, first and second lap, and that has caused him second place now as Jason Campbell goes to the inside, but he's not going to let him through. Yes, he will. He's going to have to give it to him. Jason Campbell up to P2. And Evan Bat, while all this is happening, his gap is just extending larger and larger and larger as we speak. Um, but still, Evan Bat going in the red 171 hairpin, just carrying a bunch of speed. Jason Campbell in P2 and Joe Ruck all the way back to P3 after being your pole sitter. Yeah, and it looks like there might be some transponder issues for Evan Bat as to why he's not picking up on live timing. But still, we can see up on, on the front, he has about a second gap and seems to be pulling away. Meanwhile, it's Jason Campbell that's worked his way up into P2 ahead of Joe Ruck, who just continues to struggle with that car. I don't know. He's continuing to make mistakes and just not really feeling in rhythm. So a rough start for your pole sitter. But certainly Evan Bat has gotten out to a good lead. Looks like he's been smooth, hasn't made too many mistakes. And Jason, it's going to be up to Jason Campbell by the looks of it to be able to find the pace to come up and catch him. But at the moment, it's just really coming together for Evan Bat. He's got a solid gap. Doesn't look like he's overdriving it too much. Meanwhile, Joe Ruck looks like he's still just trying to find the handling. He's losing a good amount of time to Campbell now. And now he's going to come under fire for P4 from Scott Presti, who's trying to get into the top three. Yeah, as you can see there, Jason Campbell did a 108.7, which is the fastest of all carts out there, other than I'm sure Evan Bat, because Evan Bat's transponder is not picking up. But still, we know he is leading, and we know he is fast, as he is up into P2, Jason Campbell, but still, Evan Bat out front as he goes with the green corner here. His gap probably up to about two seconds by now. As you can see here, Jason Campbell is under a lot of pressure from Joe Ruck. They are nose to tail with Scott Presti right there behind them. Yeah, now, I mean, this has been a nightmare start to the race for Ruck. He just simply does not have the pace. And in some ways, it's probably worse for him than have sim simply getting mired back on the start because now lose a little bit of confidence. Your biggest rival this weekend is now upwards of two seconds ahead of you. And it's just, it's all gone wrong for Ruck this race, just in terms of not finding a way to have the pace. And he'll have to try to salvage as much as he can from this, and whether it be a P2 or a P3. But certainly, this has gone really well for Evan Bat. And for the rest of the field, I mean, you've got a big train of carts now from about second to what looks to be sixth place. 
Yeah, no, the driver in sixth place, Chris Jennings, just went purple that last time by. Obvious we are not picking up Evan Batch Transponder, but of those other drivers, he is the fastest on the racetrack right now. He's at the tail end of that mag he's at the tail end of that second pent train. He is in the magic cart right behind Rod Clenard, trying to get up there to them and make a move and try and get up into that podium position up in front of Rod Clenard and Justin Kelly. Yeah, and Scott Presti as well as again continues to be right on Joe Ruck's rear. Now Ruck though has started to find his heart a little bit more and is right on the back of Jason Campbell. So really it's just Evan Bat up at the front who has just continuously poured in fast laps. We don't know exactly what lap times he's doing, but we just know they're fast. And we don't need to have a transponder to know that Evan Bat is in con firmly in control of this race. Behind him, I mean Campbell so nice job to get up into second, but doesn't quite have the pace that he had in the pre final. And then that big group, we haven't seen this really all weekend. This has been one of the more spread out classes, but now we're a few laps into this final at this point, and you still have guys all the way down to seventh place and Chris Jennings all within a second of each other in that big pack. And so this has really worked out to make some exciting racing. And I think some of it has to do with Joe Ruck kind of struggling early on in the race, punching everyone together. But some of it's just the carts in general are really closely matched in that field. Yeah, you can still see Evan Bat through the red 171 hairpin as Joe Ruck still trailing right behind Jason Campbell in third place. Jason Campbell still holding on to that second position as I think that's a lap car going off the track to try and get out of the way. Oh, no, that looks like Rod Clenard, actually. I'm not sure that might be. Is that Rod Clenard? It might be. It might not be. It looks like that his suit, but I don't think so. No, I don't think that is Rod Clenard. I still think I see Rod Clenard out there in sixth place, but still, Rod Clenard was purple last time by, and he is on a rock engine. He's not even in the same group as these other drivers, and he is still faster than all of them, other than, of course, the Evan Bat out front. But still, Rod Clenard is putting on a clinic in that uh, 520 Magic Cart entry. We're going to see who it is that dropped out. Now Evan Bat's transponder finally picks back up, but again, it's kind of glitching out. So now you can see... Top three, obviously Evan Batts still has a nice, comfortable lead. Jason Campbell continues to run some more times to the group behind him, although I will say Chris Jennings has kind of slowed down a little bit the last couple laps, and he's kind of threatening with falling off the back of that second group, but certainly it's been an interesting race. Joe Ruck has kind of stabilized a little bit relative to the rest of the field. He hasn't been struggling quite as much. He's been able to be, stay right on the tail of Jason Campbell for P2, and we'll have to see. I mean, if Ruck can get something going, I mean, he's certainly probably too late to catch Evan Bat or even think about it. But he can at least solidify a P2 here in a good point stay if he can just keep things going and not make any mistakes down the stretch. Yeah, and at this point, that's what you got to think about is the championship points. You can't throw yourself out of the race because that's really going to hurt you. You want to just settle for second. It gets to a point where you know you just you can't get any more out of it, and you're just going to have to settle for that a little worse finishing position. But still, Jason Campbell not making it easy on Joe Ruck as they go through the last corner here to complete lap number seven. They are rolling through here as Jason Campbell still out front. But there goes Evan Bat. Evan Bat is still leading this race by about three and a half seconds as he rolls into the Monza, and the rest of the field will follow him through. Yeah, commanding performance so far by Evan Bat. We just now got his transponder and just, got, no, just now got his data up. So really good afternoon for him. But behind him, I mean, this whole group, Scott Presti looks to be maybe the fastest one on that last with a 108.7. Really, everyone in that group ran between a 108.7 and a 108 not, or a 108 108.8 outside of Chris Jennings, who has started to lose them. This is a group from second to sixth on the track right now, all the way back to Rob Clenard, who has been really consistent around the fifth through sixth range all weekend long. So Clenard has got a lot of pace in that rock in that rock engine, different from the KZs that everyone else was running. And so it's nice to see him up at the group, a little bit of diversity in the engines. But Evan Bat is just completely dominating this race. Just looks so comfortable. The cart is very smooth. Looks like it's free enough. Not really too much of a hassle when it comes to overdriving the cart. He's just right in a rhythm, continuously stretching out a good advantage. If you look at the gap now, it's probably not right, but it says it's six seconds. I think it's more like four-ish, but still really good performance. And you can now start to kind of Take it easy on the tires a little bit. Obviously, you still want to be pushing, but you've got enough of a gap for it. Unless things go really wrong, it looks like it's going to be Evan Bat's day here. Yeah, Evan Bat, super, super impressive. A commanding lead here as he goes through the red 171 hairpin, followed by Jason Campbell and still Joe Ruck. 
Scott Presti falling closely behind in P4, and that's Justin Kelly rounding out your top five here as we go through the green corner and head toward the kink. Evan Bat still commanding lead as they go through the cell tower, and they're coming to complete lap number eight. We got about four minutes left until we hit the two to go, so I guess we have about five laps left to go in this race, and it's going to be a close one for the second place finish, but I don't know about for the lead. I think Evan Batts has got this one in the bag as long as nothing goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you've had a few of those, Connor, at this track where you get out to the lead and it's just sort of smooth sailing from there. Everyone else is fighting for second at this point. So really, it's just a very, it's a very condensed group from all the way back to six. I'm impressed that we're all the way at this late in the race and still seeing guys battle this closely through the field. I mean, we've seen earlier in the race it's been Ruck versus Bat, but outside of that, there's been a lot of kind of stagnation among these guys in the group. So for them to have this much of a battle this late in the race, it's really good to see. But obviously, Evan Bat's just in his own dimension today, and certainly in this final, thought maybe Joe, Joe Ruck would be able to put up a good con good contest against him, but obviously. Ruck just was not able to get the card to work early on in the race, and we've seen that play out, and we've seen that it's caused Jason Campbell to get up into P2 and Ruck to just fall off the pace compared to what Bat's been able to do. Yeah, super impressive from Evan Bat as he's still pulling away from the rest of the field. I'm sure he's the fastest go-kart on the track. We're not sure because his transponder is not working, but we know that he is not getting any, they are not getting any closer as Jason Campbell comes through the blue corner and down the hill towards the scale corner. You can see the mechanics on the fence giving them signals to be smooth. And that, I mean, I guess at this point, that's all you can do. Um, but, but Evan Bat crosses the line. He's got some lap traffic right in front of him uh, to work on. But he just completed lap number 10. And they have about three or four, four laps to go probably as they cross the start finish line right here. Yeah, and Bat a little bit displeased with what the lap cart was doing all, all the way coming through the chicane, obviously. You don't want to see that happen in Cardi. You don't want to see people kind of holding him up, but certainly, I mean, this has not been a particularly good race to further guys getting laughed. And so for Bat to be held up like that, it was kind of frustrating on his end, but it doesn't matter. He had a, more than enough time in the, to despair to be able to afford to get held up by a lap cart. And I mean, we see now the next guys are going to have to get caught up with it as well. And so you see, like, as they come through, coming up towards the Towards the cell tower, you can see the battle for second continues to rage on. You've got you've got Jason Campbell in P2, Joe Ruck in P3. They've been really nose to tail for the better part of the race, and Ruck has just not been able to make anything happen. He struggled to get by. He struggled to get right up on his bumper, and that's just, I mean, it's got to be frustrating for Joe Ruck. I mean, obviously, he came into the race thinking he had a good shot at winning starting from the pole. To not have that happen is a little bit frustrating, but at the same time, He's going to still have a good point stake and stand on the podium and has a shot at getting second. As he runs wide, coming out of the final corner, gets in the grass, almost lost the cart there. So, again, that's just one of those things where you're having a good point stake. You don't need to make it worse, but you don't need to make sort of the failure to keep, keep up with Evan Bat even worse by throwing away a decent point stake like he almost did right there. Yeah, you don't want to put salt in the wound. Um, I'm sure he was hoping to have a better final here, but either something up with the go-kart or something else wrong as they pass some lap traffic through the red 171 hairpin. Got the blue flags from the light system. Very fancy from the Stars Championship Series as they roll through the green corner and watch uh, Evan Batts still driving away with a commanding win. As you can see, he's about a corner ahead of the rest of the field and still not catching him at all is Jason Campbell in second place. Joe Rook tr still trying to get around Jason Campbell for that second podium position. And we've seen now a lot of battling going on further back in the field of around around the 8th through 11th position. Obviously, you've got Brad Denoff rounding out the top 10 in his KZ. And then, obviously, you've got a lot of KZs around there. And then Hugh Templeman in P14 as well has been another guy that's been on the move. Starting in 22nd, he's up to 14th in his Rockmaster. But as they come down, you can see that they've got three laps to go now. Did not quite beat the timer on that lap. And now you can see Joe Ruck has found a way. Excuse me, no. Joe Ruck is still in P3. It looks like the battle's going on for P4 now. And I believe that is... Scott Presti that came under fire from Justin Kelly there. As Kelly's been able to work his way up into P4. He's coming through now the scoreboard section. We'll see now what goes on beyond them. But then, I mean, this is just a really good battle here. Now, Scott Presti fell back from P4. Now he's under attack from Rod Clonard in P6. So this could be a really bad lap as now Clonard does get past coming through the green corner. It's now a P5 position for Rod Clonard, the highest by far of any of the Rockmasters. Excuse me, he's not by far. He's got Christian, he's just fine. 
but still the highest of the Rock Masters, and he's got a lot of pace in that cart. As you see, the Scott Presti started to fall away a little bit. So they're going to come now, coming up to two laps to go. Evan Back continues to be in command of this race. He is just dominant compared to everyone else in the field. We've seen that he's had to undergo some conflict with, obviously, Joe Ruck over the course of the weekend, over the heat races and the pre-final. But he's come out on top, and now he is in the clear. This has been a dominant performance for him. He's got a big gap in hand on Jason Campbell. Looks to be a couple of seconds, maybe three or four even. And then you've got a gap back to Justin Kelly and Rob Clenard in fourth and fifth. Scott Presti again fell back in sixth, and now he's got Chris Jennings all over him. So this has been a very exciting battle for the middle part of the top ten, but certainly all eyes at the moment are on the second and third battle, which looks like Jason Campbell and Joe Ruck are going to go at it in these last couple of laps. Ruck is as close as he's been now. Yeah, I can tell that these drivers are starting to get a little bit tired here. I'm seeing more and more of them start to hang tires off the side of the track. And you can see Evan Batts still holding on to his lead. It looks like second and third might be starting to catch him, but that could just be him saving his stuff. He does not want to make a mistake and make this good day a bad day. So he's just going to hang on to this as he finishes. There's three more corners to go left, two laps remaining. As he comes across the line, there will be one to go. White flag is in the air for Evan Bat as he looks back and sees that there is no one there and there. There go the second and third place drivers, Jason Campbell and Joe Ruck. They are 14 laps into their, this 15 lap race, one lap remaining as they go through the I-70 corner. Still Evan Bat commanding lead here as they go through the Monza. Still no change for position for second and third as they run up on this lap car. Will he get out of the way? We'll see here shortly. Yes, he, oh no, he didn't open up the corner. I thought he was going to let him by. There he goes. He lifts and lets second and third place through. No, not yet. There he goes. But yes, Joe Ruck right on the back of Jason Campbell as they exit the green corner and into the kink. Evan Bat, though, the story of the day. Won, almost won the pre-final and is leading the final with a commanding lead. And he qualified on pole earlier this weekend and did, was unfortunately not able to get any hole shots this weekend as Joe Ruck was able to get them off the line. But he just was way faster in pace and was able to get the lead here and is now coming through the last three corners to finish out his weekend. Jason Campbell still in second. Joe Ruck not making any moves there, so he's going to have to settle for third. As Evan Bat crosses the line, two hands in the air as he swerves to the right, takes the win here. Evan Bat finally gets a good race for him under his belt and takes the win here in the main event for the KZ Shifter Master Drivers. Yeah, Jason Campbell able to hang on for P2. Joe Ruck rounds out your podium in P3. Justin Kelly able to finish up in fourth place. Rob Clenard rounds out your top five. The top of the Rock Masters. Chris Jennings just behind him in P6. Really dug deep on the last lap. Scott Presti as well. We saw him dip a wheel coming out of the final corner. He finishes up in seventh place. Jeff Mills in eighth. Robert Fiji in ninth. And rounding out your top ten is Anthony Stifler. Continuing on down the list, you got Chad Lee in 11th. Morn Van Talk in 12th. Hugh Templeman, 13th, 22nd to 13th in P13, Jordan Littlefoot Field in P14, and Tiffany Kelly rounding out your top 15 in KZ and Rock Masters. Coming up next, though, we've got one of the most fun classes on the weekend. It's been chaotic. It's been crazy. It's been KA Jr. Coming up next on Kart Chaser. I'm David Serra, 18 time Australian karting champion, and we're launching Kart Class. Kart Class is an advanced digital training program that suits a driver who's just starting out in the sport, all the way to the driver looking to win a national championship. In this program, you're going to be learning about how to find the ideal racing line and what an apex is. Braking and throttle markers, wet weather racing lines, and how to overtake other competitors. We target how to break in the wet weather, and we look on the mental side of kart racing as well with our mental skills coach. At the completion of this program, you'll be lighting up purple sectors in qualifying, know where to defend on the opening laps, and how to pressure your opposition into mistakes. We teach you the tools to be resilient and how to get in the right frame of mind before a race. We look to complete the whole package by getting a strong mindset, a driving style to suit all conditions, strategizing your race, and getting the last 1% from your team. We'll teach you how to win the final lap of a race, drive in the wet like Max Verstappen, and creating the perfect bubble for yourself to mentally be in the zone. To find out more, click the link below. Kart Store USA is a kart parts supplier that racers and retailers can count on when they need reliable advice and service. We focus on servicing all racers with honesty and pride while maintaining customer satisfaction. We carry a full stock of Kart Republic and Tony Kart chassis, 
as well as IAMI and Vortex Rock engines. We've also got a host of other parts available and in stock, such as products from Rev Performance Materials, Jekko Racing Seats, and more. We have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And on top of that, if your order exceeds $200, shipping is on us. Check out all we have to offer today by visiting us online at cartstore-usa.com. As the Western importer of the Praga and Formula K chassis brands, Leading Edge Motorsports is a high-performance kart shop and race team with a simple mission. Teach others the joy of high-performance driving, supply our customers with the highest quality products and services, and most of all, win races. With our remarkable racing inventory, expert services, and top-ranked national-level team to back it up, we'll help to get your new kart racing package up and running fast. From arrive and drive service to kart preparation and driver coaching, to the parts you need to get you back on the racetrack, Leading Edge Motorsports is the industry answer. Here we go, all set to go for the KA Junior Class. Rolling out on the pole position will be Max Taylor. Followed closely behind him in the pre-final was John Antonino. This is going to be a good race here as we've had a lot of good races in the K Junior class. John Antonino has been one of the headlines in this class as he won heat two and was running up front the whole race in heat number uh, in the pre-final. As I, th I think that's uh, Austin Olds is up there as well in the front row. So um, getting ready to get started here and for their main event should be right around the 14 lap mark, 13 laps in this race. So we got a lot of time to make moves happen and uh, it's going to be an exciting race to watch for sure. We finished the pre-final last time. It was one of the most exciting finishes we've seen all weekend long. I mean, you're talking about Austin Olds being able to hang it around the outside of Max Taylor at the finish line to secure the victory. Would that have happened in the final? Who knows, but it got Olds the pole position for this, pre for this final race. Eli Warren's on row two. He had a rough pre-final start, but was able to get himself all the way back up into that lead, lead group. He's joined on row two with John Antonino, as we already mentioned. Antonino has been really quick all weekend, a little bit aggressive as well, had a really nice move around the outside of the double lefts. But any, anyway, this is a really stacked field so far. It's a lot of fast drivers here, and looking for a green, looking, and we're green we got into it. turn one. Here we go. Austin Olds leading your field down into the first corner as they're going to follow in behind Eli Warren up into second. Can we make it through the first corner clean? It looks like we will. We have one driver off the track, but overall, really clean for the K Junior class. Eli Warren slots into second. Austin Olds stays in the lead, and Max Taylor up into third. We got a couple guys all coming through the Monza. It looks like the 861 cart had a little bit of an issue earlier in the prefinal as well. As now you see Austin Olds is leading the race now ahead of Eli Warren in P2. Then you've got a little bit of a gap, and then Max Taylor's right on his Eli Warren's bumper in P3 now. Looks like that's Luke Powers in P4. It's Leslie Gumler is off the track again. He had a rough pre-final spun out in that one as well. Looks like his, pre his final might be coming in at 10 as he barely gets it going. Meanwhile, back at the front of the grid, you've still got Austin Olds at the front. Now Max Taylor's worked his way past Eli Warren for P2. Good start for, good start for all of these guys as well to keep it clean. Back down looking through the rest of the lead group, you've got what looks to be Luke Powers in P4. Aiden Patty's in that group as well. Then all the way back, I think, to about P9 or so, which is Patty. Or it looks like Aiden Patty is about P8 is the final guy in that group. Tail end of the group is also John Anton. You know in there. You've really got about eight carts all under a blanket. And it's Ryan Miller in P5, Charlie Sines in P6. Looking at the front of the pack, though, it's Max Taylor back up to the race lead. It's Eli Warren into P2. Already you can see the shuffling. Austin Old shuffle back to P3. Is Warren going to waste any time? He's going to stick behind Taylor for the time being. We saw these two work really well together in the pre-final. Looks like starting out the final, they're working out well as well. Now, bit, a little bit of a gap now between the top three and Luke Powers in P4. That whole group dating all the way back to P6, and then even John Antonino and Aiden Patty in P8. All of them are right there together. It's early on in the race. It's crucial to get track position, as you can see. I mean, this has been a really good start to the race for Max Taylor. He's going to have the chance to command this race from the get-go to control the race. Now down the inside, Luke Powers on the inside of Austin Olds, and Olds' slide continues on the start of this lap as he's gone from first to fourth over the course of this lap. And now you can see Max Taylor continues to just command the race at the front. You've got Eli Warren and Luke Powers in P2 and 3, a pair of red speeds working together. Now we'll see if they try to make a move on Max Taylor anytime soon. 
Olds is in P4. You can see he's struggling with the cart through the S. is really kind of struggling to keep up with those top three. Olds, I don't know if it's too low on tire pressure or just simple driver mistakes, but whatever the case may be, the MP MPG Motorsports guy is struggling to keep up with the pace of guys like Eli Warren and Luke Powers who go P1 and P2 at the moment. So it looks like we've got another issue back in the field. I think that might be um, Jake James on the 869 is off the track and waiting. As it looks like he might have spun or something. But in the moment, it's Eli Warren into P1. It's Luke Powers in P2. And now in P3, Austin Olds has found his way back by Max Taylor. Taylor has to go defensive into the, into the scoreboard to keep ahead of Ryan Miller in P5. Then, I mean, that, that's allowed the entire group to kind of consolidate back together, even down to Ayrton Grimm, who just went purple in P10 with a 115.6. Grimm has had a lot of troubles over the course of the weekend. We saw in the heat race, he had one of the more bizarre crashes in turn one that led him going all the way over the hill. But he's found a way to find some more pace. He's up seven spots already in the first couple laps of this race. And he's on the tail end of that group as, pa as Eli Warren and Luke Powers continue to lead this race. Yeah, Eli Warren has a... Uh been a little bit all over the place this weekend, but he's found his groove here in the main event, leading in front of Luke Powers, the two red speeds out front. Max Taylor creating some drama back there in the third position. As you can see, him and Austin Old battling for third and fourth. As Max Taylor almost hangs a tire coming out of the last corner there. You can see Ayrton Grimm trailing the end of that train as they go into turn one. Lots of moves being made. Air, whoa, John Anton, you know, they're three wide exiting that corner. That's going to split that group up a little bit and give Max Taylor a little bit of breathing room as they go into the Monza here. Still, though, the two red speeds out front of Eli Warren and Luke Powers leading them into the red 171 hairpin as Max Taylor still in P3 here. Austin Olds following closely behind in P4. And that's a new face in turn five as there's a yellow flag here going through turn uh, that, that would be the green corner as they go up the hill and getting ready to go into the cell tower corner here. The two leaders pulling away from the rest of the field as Max Taylor is putting his head down, trying to put down qualifying laps to try and run those two down as they head through the double left and into the blue corner right here as the rest of the field starts to stretch out a little bit. Last lap, they were all nose to tail, and now after the little incidents they've had this lap, they're starting to spread out as they head into the last four corners here to complete lap number four. Purple last time by was indeed Ayrton Grimm. This lap, it should be reset by the front two runners. We'll see as they cross the line. Yes, Eli Warren goes purple. Max Taylor, about three and a half tenths off of their pace. He's going to need some some time if he wants to start running those leaders down. Yeah, the top two of Warren and Powers are doing a really good job working together. So, oh, Max Taylor dropped a wheel coming out of the I-70 corner. Don't think it's going to cost him a position, but still not ideal when you're trying to chase down those front two, and the red speeds have shown to be committed to working with each other. We've seen that Eli Warren has been consistent all weekend. He's had his struggles, but he's found ways to continuously have the pace. You've seen Luke Powers has been around the top ten. Now he's up at the front. He seems content to work with his red speed friend and continue to work together to kind of push away. Max Taylor's had the pace, but now he's got he's made a mistake. He's got kind of stuck in a gaggle of carts now. It was Austin Olds is behind him. Looks like Henry or Ryan Miller as well in P5 is right on his rear end as well. And then behind those guys, you've got John Antonino, who we saw making a big pass coming into turn one a couple laps ago. He's up into P6 now. That whole group has started to come back together again a little bit. And all the way back to Aiden Patty in P10, I believe. All of them are still in a group. Ayrton Grimm is it right in there as well. Grimm has been on purple a couple of times. We'll see what happens this lap as these guys finally go through a full lap without completely having complete chaos with each other. As they come across the line, Warren resets fastest lap. Nobody else can really come close to that. Powers is right there with them. But outside of that, I mean, these guys are running upwards a half a second off of what the two leaders are doing. Yeah, Eli Warren is a local kid around here, and he has not really been on the national scene that much as he started in 206 and has worked his way up into the K divisions. Here he is leading this race, and he's, uh, he looks comfortable out there, to say the least, as uh, he's driving away from the rest of the field. Him and Luke Powers working together well, the two red speeds matching as they go through the green corner here. Max Taylor about two seconds, two and a half seconds behind them as he goes to the kink here trying to run them down but really as as of right now they are not able to run them down at all they are getting pulled by eli warren last time by eli warren was 1.1 seconds faster than max taylor and if that continues this is going to be a bit of a i mean it's it's not going to be very entertaining for the th battle for the third position as they are stretching out 
the lead as they continue to come. They're about to finish lap number six as they come across the line this time. Two corners to go until they finish lap number six. We got about six and a half minutes left on the clock. I'm expecting to see Luke Powers and Eli Warren continue to work together as they cross the line, and they are doing consistent low 14s as Max Taylor clocks a 14.2. That's fast, but it's not going to be fast enough to run down those leaders. He needs to be faster than that. We'll see here shortly if he is able to pick up the pace as Austin Olds goes by Max Taylor for third. Austin Olds said, you are not fast enough. I need to get in front of this train and try and lead you guys to the front pack. And it's ironic, too, because Olds had struggled early on in the race. It was part of the reason that this pack had a split, but now he clearly thinks his cards come in, and he has the pace to be able to chase them down, and we'll have to see how that goes. But at the moment, just the front two guys are content to work with each other. Eli Warren has clearly had a lot of pace in that car all weekend. Luke Powers has been content to work with him throughout this race. Then you've got Olds in P3. He's got, he's got a good amount of pace as well, but it took him so long to get back back to the, a good rhythm after the first couple of laps where he really struggled. Meanwhile, you have battles coming through the double left, so it looks like Ryan Miller came under attack from John Antonino there, got, as well as that Charlie Steins in P7, trying to make a move as well. But really, that split up that group as well. So now you have third and fourth and Taylor and Olds all together, and then you have Antonino and then Ryan Miller and Charlie signs all together as well from seventh or from fifth to seventh, kind of getting broken up. Yeah, we got about five minutes left to go here. As you can see, the two leaders reset their purple lap time. They do a 13.6. Austin Olds, 14.0. That is not going to get them up to the lead group if they keep doing these times. They need to be like half a second a lot faster if they want to run down these leaders, which I do not think is possible right now, which makes me think this is going to be a battle between Eli Warren and Luke Powers as they head into the red 171 hairpin. They got about, I'd say, six laps to go next time they cross the stripe, four or five, maybe five laps to go next time they cross the stripe. This is going to be a commanding victory for whoever one of these two drivers takes the win. It's going to be a good day for the red speeds. And... Uh, I'm hoping to see some more new faces up here as I have not seen much about Eli Warren, nor have I seen much about Luke Powers. I'm excited to see which one of these two drivers can make their breakout win and get the win here in the Stars Championship Series. Well, this is going to be a potential for a real breakthrough for Eli Warren in particular. The local kid obviously has a lot of speed around this place, and he's been racing against some really good junior drivers, whether it be through Austin Olds, Max Taylor, John Antonino, Ayrton Grimm, Aiden Patty. All of those guys have been on the national scene at various points, have shown a lot of pace. These two up at the front are really showing them out, though. I mean, they have been fast throughout. Luke Powers just resets purple with a 113.690. Taylor and Olds just cannot match that pace. It's just frustrating for them. It has to be to do all that you can and still see the front two just driving away. And so now it looks like the battle is just going to be between the front two and Warren and Powers and then the rest of the field. And it really is a reward for how good they've been able to work together, whether it be whether it be Powers in the second or Warren leading the race. You've seen that they've continuously not try to do anything stupid. They've been able to drive consistent lap times, cons consistently get faster, and that's just something that you have to you have to really sort of admire. As we have one car out on the grass coming out of the last couple corners here. We'll try to get a number on that in just a second, I believe. That looks like that the 828. Of C.J. Bowman, who was looked like he was somewhere in the middle of the field around 15th or so, so a rough go for C.J. there. But as you come back, you still have the front two with a pretty massive gap now from third on back, and now Warren's just got to be thinking, what do I have to do to keep this lead? And then on power side of things, it's just going to be timing it up because you know Eli Warren's going to defend wherever possible. So, oh, John Antonino almost lost it coming out of the scale tower corner, still maintains his P5 position right now, but now Ayrton Grimm and Aiden Patty are back on that group. So wow, was really sketchy from John Antonino, almost losing the car. He's pushing for everything he can, try to get up to that group with Taylor and Austin Olds, but just not quite enough for Antonino. He's still in front. They decided to work with him there, but still now, now they get a little bit bumbled up coming out of the turn one. Looks to me like it might be him, Ryan Miller kind of coming under attack. Ayrton Grimm just sent one down the inside of Charlie Sainz. I don't know if that was the smartest location to try to pass that. So it leads him vulnerable to Aiden Patty on the inside, and Patty's going to make quick work of that. So this group in general has been very chaotic over the last half lap, led by Antonino. The thing is, they're still not losing that much time to Austin Olds and Taylor. I think those two are both kind of struggling with their card and their setup. So just not been a race for those two to really remember. Those were the front row, if you recall. And both of them looked to have aspirations of winning this race. That seems to be out the window now. And now they're just fighting for that last podium spot. Yeah, it's still incredible how fast Eli Warren and Luke Powers are. They're about three-tenths a lot faster 
than Max Taylor and Austin Olds. And Max Taylor has been running at the front at Scusa and USPKS this year. He's been really good and picking up the pace really fast as he's only been carting for a few years now. Eli Warren crosses the start finish line. A minute and 30 left until we get two to go. We got four laps to go right now going into the I-70 corner. That looks like Luke Powers. Luke Powers just goes for the lead. Yes, Luke Powers is through to the lead on Eli Warren. Eli Warren's going to get put back to second place. Luke Powers has four laps to go until he reaches the checkered flag. Will he be able to hold on to it, or will Eli Warren make a fight back for the lead? Powers gets up to the lead. Obviously, we had discussed about how patient he was willing to be, how, when would he make his move. Powers obviously wanted to get the move done before Warren had a chance to block him, and obviously I think that's a pretty smart move. We've seen throughout this weekend that the driver of the sun first usually has jurisdiction on where they can block on this track. Almost every corner is possible to really block well. And, I mean, we've seen earlier in the race, we saw Adam Maxwell and Mick Gabriel had a really good battle. Debatable which one of those had the better positioning, but obviously Gabriel ended up on top. We're seeing this again now with Eli Warren and Luke Powers, and it seems like Powers has decided now was the time. It's time to get up in front, race on his own terms. It's going to be now up to Warren to try to make the pass back. Is he going to be patient and just stick with him? Obviously, they still have upwards of four seconds of gap to play with, so it's not like it's a do-or-die situation, but still... You, get, you see now as Luke Powers motions to Eli Warren to work with him. See how that works. I mean, obviously, you make a pass one lap and expect that dude to work right with you, but Eli Warren listens to him. He's obviously content with both of them being in the situation they are. There's only three laps to go. Going to be coming to two to go this time by. Obviously, the front two are up there. He's still got Max Taylor and Austin Olds battling it out for the final podium position. John Antonino and that group that he was leading has been able to catch them. And then further on back, the whole group from about fourth all the way back to eight has been able to drop Ayrton Grimm now as they guarded him by almost a second on that last stop. So tough break for Grimm, who had a good start to the race, but certainly everyone from Max Taylor to Aiden Patty in eighth all has a good shot at a podium in some capacity. So as they come down, coming towards you to go, you can see coming through the cell tower now, just looks like Powers has a decent bit of pace. He's not necessarily holding up Warren, but certainly Warren has been the headliner in this group as now we see a pass for third as Austin Olds gets himself up onto the podium into the podium spots now. Olds is ahead of Max Taylor in P3. Then behind him, he looks like you've got John Antonio still, Ryan Miller and Charlie Steins, all of them, Linus Stern, continuing to work with each other, although Steins has lost that group and is closer to eight, and Patty in eighth. But still, third through six, all under a blanket. You've got Olds now retaking that third position. Now coming to two to go. Here they go, coming to a blue flag bag mark. He lets them go easily. Luke Powers continues, does not block too much into turn one. You've still got him and Eli Warren comfortably ahead of the field. As I look, you look back to the group for th that are fighting for the podium, it still looks like it's been Austin Olds and third able to hold on, but certainly it, all eyes are up front where you've got Luke Powers up at the front, still running fast lap times. Eli Warren is in second. He's been able to hang on, although he has lost about a cart length or two, but that shouldn't matter too much as he's going to be right up on the back end of Powers at the end of the lap if he can hang on and stay in the draft. Yeah, Eli Warren starting to fall back a little bit here. He's got about two or three cart lengths. He needs to catch up to get to Luke Powers' bumper. We have about a lap and a half to go. They're going to be coming to get the white flag this time by. Luke Powers ran second for most of this race behind Eli Warren, just pushing him, getting away from the rest of the field. As you can see, Austin Olds is nowhere to be seen. This is a battle between just the two of them. Eli Warren tucking, trying to get back to Luke Powers' bumper. Maybe he's overheated the tires. Maybe his tire pressures have fallen off. Who knows? But this is the last lap. K.A. Jr., one lap to go. Luke Powers takes a look over his shoulder. He's got a gap. He tucks. He's trying to get the most out of it. He looks back again, tries to see where he is compared to Eli Warren. He's not going to block into turn one. He's got plenty of space so far. Eli Warren's given it all he's got to try and get back up to Luke Powers on this last lap. We got about 10 corners left to go until we reach the checkered flag. Luke Powers still has a commanding lead as we head into the red 171 hairpin. Eli Warren trying to get the most out of it as he can right up next to the apex there in the hairpin. Look back again. Looks back again. Luke Powers looking back a lot. He's not really focused on what's in front of him, just on what's behind him. And that is Eli Warren right behind him as they go through the kink. He blocks already. That means Eli Warren is right back in it. Yep, Eli Warren is right there. Luke Powers has been blocking the last two corners now. That has put Eli Warren right back on his bumper as they head through the double left here and back into the right. Eli Warren is right on Luke Powers' bumper as they go towards the uh, scale tower corner. Austin Olds has made it up into the third position. 
as they come through the last four corners here. Will he make a move? He's going to try to go to the outside. It's not going to work. He's going to try and cross him over here. It's not going to work. He's going to go through the last corner here. Maybe he'll get a crossover on the last chance. And he, whoa, that was close. He did not make it happen. 62 thousandths of a second splits Luke Powers and Eli Warren. Luke Powers is able to get the win here. Awesome job to both of those two drivers for being so smart and working together. Tough break for Eli, Eli Warren after leading so much of the race to come home in P2. He's got to be disappointed with that one, but you can't be. you got to be proud of yourself for coming home in a P2. You can't even see P3 behind you. Awesome race between those two red speed drivers. And good job to Austin Olds as well for getting on that final spot of the podium. Max Taylor in fourth. Ryan Miller rounds out your top five with the Trinity Carding Group. Charlie Steins comes home P6. Aiden Patty P7. Ayrton Grimm P8. John Antonino P9. And Anthony Rivera rounding out your top ten. We've still got a lot of racing left to go today, as you will see. Uh, what do you think about that one, Emery? Uh, chaotic race. It was really smart from Luke Powers, Neil I. Warren. Everyone else in that second group did not have the pace, nor the racecraft, I don't think, to be able to make it work in this one. It was smart driving by both of them, and in the end, Powers' decision to get the lead, get the track position with four laps to go, proved to be really important. So a really good win for Luke Powers. Really managed that well. His patience paid off for him, being able to work with Neil I. Warren through most of the race and come up when it matters most. But that's all. What an exciting KA Junior race. Another one that we've seen. And we've still got one more race to do. It's the KZ Stars. It's the big show. And we'll be coming up, covering it live next on Cart Chaser. Group A Apparel, designed for the athlete and all of us. Check out more online at groupaapparel.com. Apparel in USA, a top-level performance team with unmatched hospitality. Offering a full-service driver development program with year-round testing available in Miami, Florida. And the official North America racing team of Peril and Racing Chassis. Chassis and parts available at perilinusa.com. If you're looking for top-grade equipment, look no further than Rev Performance Materials engine mounts, sprockets, and RK chains. Available online now at RevPerformanceMaterials.com and through a dealer near you. The highest quality material built to the highest quality standards. Rev Performance Materials. Well, the sun is out here. It is a beautiful afternoon. A little bit uh, windy still. Uh, temperatures in the low 60s here on Sunday afternoon at Newcastle Motorsports Park. It's time to crown the king or queen of the castle here for the Pro Stars Division. Split up with Group 1 and Group 2 using either KZ or Rock engines. We've got them lined up on the grid and we're just about set to get started. I'm back in the booth here. My name's Andrew Clements. Alongside me who's been your announcer all day long, Connor Zillers, at the end of a full day of announcing here. Seen some good racing, seen some more spread out races, but nothing really amps everybody up like a standing start with the shifter carts. Am I right, Connor? Yeah, no, it's going to be an exciting race for sure. We saw Vincenzo Saracino run Talon Yackel down last race and get the pre-final win, so it's going to be interesting to see who gets the whole shot and who can pull away here, or maybe we're going to have a race till the end. Who knows? Well, let's take you through the starting lineup here for your pro shifter and uh, pro and rock 
Stars divisions. First up, of course, Vincenzo Saracino, as Connor mentioned, drove through the field, was able to get through to the lead late in the going in the pre-final to take over the lead of the win. He'll start from the point here for the main event alongside him on the front row. Talon Yakul has been impressive in his rookie season in the pro shifter category. Joins him to make up row number one. Row two, another driver who's been super impressive this weekend, Annie Rule. Took girl power to the top of the boards in final practice on Friday. Has had kind of an up and down weekend here with a heat race win on Saturday afternoon. And then a decent day here to put her on the inside of row two for Sunday. Alongside her, Calvin Ming, whose uh, part-time karting schedule puts him back in the seat up near the front of the grid. Row three will be Ian Quinn in the Ohio Kart Parts, number 286 to the outside of him. The winner in the group two division pre-final and sixth overall, Blake Hunt. What a rock power machine makes up the outside of row three. Row four will be Zach Frank, the 298 Georgia based driver in the eyes up body symmetry MD uh, race factory cart to the outside of him. Josh Conker, the Canadian's energy chassis currently on the outside of row four and second in the group two rock division. Rounding the top 10, it's rookie Parker DeLong, the youngest driver in the field at 13 years old with an age waiver to move up early into the gearbox category. He starts to the inside of Gavin Ivey. Then it's Brian Bowley and Blake Korth to make up row six. Kyle Kennedy, Evan Poliski, row seven. Robbie Campbell and James Overback, row eight. Gary, uh, Corey Moult, the mill, and Ryan Aiden Jr., row nine. Eric Hugh and Nathan Nicholson, row 10. And Mavisa Landon will start shotgun on your field here in Rock and KZ Stars, the pro overall stars division to crown king of the castle. Vincenzo Saracino, Talon Yockel, the front row, lined and ready, the back of the field, getting into their boxes. Everybody looks good. We've got the green light from our race director. We go to the starting lights here, and the sequence begins with the red lights beginning. One, two, three, four, and here we go. Lights out, we're away. Who gets the jump off the line? Saracino will, the experienced sifter driver, gets the whole shot down to turn one. Yockel into second. Annie Rule is going to get done around the outside as it looks like Ian Quinn got a good start. He'll slot into third now, uh, applying some pressure to Talon Yockel. Calvin Ming is in fifth. Zach Frank misses a shift coming out the Monza. Josh Conker gets by him. And everybody's chasing the privateer, a magic cart driver, Vincenzo Saracino, while they battle for second. Ian Quinn gets through on Yockel. Rule nearly gets by on her teammate. She stays in fourth. Great start for Ian Quinn from P5 to P2 here off the jump. Yeah, great start for Wells. Vincenzo Saracino got out front early, kept his head down, didn't look back, and he's already oh, got about a second. Josh Conker over the top of Calvin Ming. Sorry about that there. Ming now having to hang on, and Conker falling further back. That was back for fifth. Yeah, like I said, Vincenzo Saracino, good first lap, got himself a nice, healthy gap. Uh, Talon Yockel right back to second place, though. He was not going to let Ian Ming, or Ian, <laughs> Ian, Quinn. Ian, Ian Quinn stay out front for much, much longer as he go goes by in the scale tower corner. As they come by to complete the first lap, he's going to have about a 1.2 second gap that he needs to close. That's Talon Yockel in second place following Vincenzo Saracino. Yeah, Talon Yockel there with uh, uh, overall a lot of pace in that magic cart, and he has... Not really gotten great jumps throughout the weekend, but as a whole, the pace has been pretty good. As we see, there's uh, Annie Rule going down the inside of Ian Quinn. Quinn trying to fight back, back for third. Not able to fully get the job done. Still going to drag race up the hill to the green corner. Rule will finally complete the pass up there. Quinn drops in line to fourth, and Annie Rule gets herself back to her starting position and now sets her sights on Yockel and Saracino, who have already gotten probably about a second to a second and a half up the road towards the cell tower hairpin. Yeah, Yakel's already starting to close that gap down, and it's only lap two. Um, really impressive from him. This is kind of what we saw in the, the pre-final, other, other than the roles being reversed. It was Yakel trying to pull away from Saracino, but now it's Saracino trying to pull away from Yakel. But Yakel is closing the gap, and he's closing it fast as they come through to complete lap number two. Vincenzo Saracino almost hangs a tire right there. The gap is down to only two and a quarter of a tenth. He was a second faster than Saracino that last time by, and he's going to look to try and make a move, and he's not going to be able to do it on I-70. Yeah, definitely trying to get by there for the spot. Not able to do it still to the Monza. He stays tucked in line behind Saracino as they exit. And he rule all the while, able to close up while Yakel's getting... Uh, uh, a little bit of trouble trying to pass for the lead. That's allowing Rule to close in. Ian Quinn, not so much, but he does have Calvin Ming breathing down his neck for the fourth spot as we watch them make their way over out of the green turn and towards the back sector once again. Yeah, 
Annie Rule is really starting to close up, as you see bef when they crossed the line last time by. She was about 1.7 behind the leader, and if I had to take a guess, I would say she's about half a second back now. So she's closing in, and that's going to make it a three-cart race for the lead going down to the scale tower corner. Yeah, here they go towards the scale tower corner once again. They'll round it, go through the grid turn. Saraceno, Yockel, Rule, one, two, three, nose to tail into the final turn. Only a couple of laps in. You can see the countdown clock. We still got ten and a half minutes plus two laps to go. Down the front stretch, Yockel taking a look, going high, going low. Saraceno blocks low and Rule down the inside on Yockel. Nearly gets by and they all get tripped up. As look at that, Parker DeLong is up five spots into fourth. And last time by, he was a half second quicker than the leaders. Parker DeLong digging forward. Yeah, Parker DeLong's making his way up the pack. As you see, Annie Rule was about 1.3 seconds faster than the leaders that last time by. Still not faster than Talon Yockel's fastest time, though. Vincenzo Saracino is a good bit off the pace as we're looking at his times here. Still got some work to do here. Talon Yockel trying to find a way past as Andy Rule is putting the pressure on him as they go through the Skelt Tower corner and into the carousel. Still, Vincenzo Saracino leading. Yeah, again, great stuff from Parker DeLong. They are not terribly far back from this leading group of three. Vincenzo Saracino doing a great job making that cart as wide as he possibly can. Through the final couple corners here, they'll put four laps down and in the books. Parker DeLong's group, about a second and a half back. It might get closer if they uh, continue to mess about at the front. Here's Yakel again, looking high, looking low. Not going to do it. Saracino again blocks at the end of the straightaway, keeps Yakel at bay. Talon Yakel's going to need to come up with a new game plan here because that one not working. He's looked multiple naps now where he's kind of seemed to set up for a pass in the I 70 corner. And it's not paid off at this point. He's got to go back to the drawing board, find a new opportunity to find a way by Saraceno. Yeah, that's a lot of shifter racing his strategy and trying to find a way around people. You've got to set up passes, corners prior to the actual pass. So that's what kind of what Talon Yako needs to try and work on is setting up a pass here on Vincenzo Saraceno because he clearly has the pace to get around him. But Saraceno is not making it easy on him, blocking in a lot of corners and keeping Andy Rule and Talon Yako right behind him here. This is what he's going to have to do for a lot of the race if he cannot get his pace to get any quicker here because Parker DeLong is about four-tenths of a second faster than Saracino, and he's bringing three other carts along with him here as they go through the grid corner and down onto the front straight to complete lap number five. Vincenzo Saracino still leading, but not by a lot. I walked by Vincenzo Saracino and his dad after the second heat race earlier this morning, and I heard Vincenzo kind of talking about how he felt like the cart, uh, the cart tire sidewall was just kind of falling on its side when you get to the center of the corner, so he couldn't carry nearly as much center corner speed, which, again, that makes sense. You can see how much Talon Yockel and Annie Roll are kind of getting uh, blown back uh, by how slow they have to go in the middle of the turn. Saraceno gets in just as hot as they do, but he's not able to roll nearly as much miles per hour through the center of the turn, and uh, it shows on the lap charts as well. Parker DeLong and his group, they were three-tenths quicker than the leaders again. So they're catching the top three. And Yockel and Rule, I mean, Rule's had a couple years in shifter racing. Yockel is a shifter rookie, but this is the best run we've seen on any Rule here in Stars Championship competition. And for Yockel, I mean, he just hasn't been, you know, up front at this level. Like you said, Connor, shifter racing, the passes need to be a lot more thought out. It's not nearly as effortless as a single seat pass, because like you, we've seen with Saraceno, and like you've described over the weekend, if the guy knows you're going to go in a specific corner, he's just going to block, go low, drop one extra gear, and exit about as good as he would taking the normal line, or within close to that. So it's easy to defend. Saraceno knows that. He knows he's just got to kind of cover off turn number one. The rest of the track is fair game if Talon can back up the corner right and get the launch on exit that he needs. And he's only really been able to do that out of the final turn. Can he do that here out of the scoreboard or the red 171 corner this time? We'll see. He's not close enough for a dive. Maybe a good exit could bring him close. Yeah, you can see Talon Yako really struggling to get around Vincenzo Saracino as they go through the green corner right here. Still no moves being made in the top three. Parker DeLong starting to catch Annie Rule. Annie Rule starting to lose a little bit to the leaders as Parker DeLong was only half a tenth faster than the leader that last time by. Vincenzo Saracino finally starting to pick up the pace as his tires are picking up temperature and pressure. He's finally starting to get some pace out of that thing and is almost purple that last time by and is starting to get a little bit of a gap built behind him to get to Talon Yockel. So we'll see if Talon Yockel will be able to hold, keep up with him and maybe get around him here shortly because there's only six minutes until we go two to go. That's what you see a lot out of some of the veteran drivers, some of the great drivers here in this sport is 
you know, we talk about tire pressure and tire heat. That's a big name of the game when it comes to these longer sessions. Um, and you'll see guys like Saraceno and uh, like yourself, like Norberg, uh, like Jarsakrak, all the guys we've talked about over the years here who prefer really to run kind of a lower tire pressure if they had kind of to pick one side of the corner or the other uh, so that way they maybe only come in in the last few laps because at least then the tire never fully falls off onto its face when it overheats. Um, in this case, that could be the strategy Saraceno tried to go with, maybe going a little bit uh, sacrificing the first half of the race to hope that he'll still have something to fight with in the end. But that time by, he equaled his best lap, didn't go any better. There was someone else who went a little bit quicker. Yeah, if you look at all the fast times between the top seven drivers, they are all within one-tenth of a second. And they are all only, the top seven are only split by three seconds. So it's a really close battle up front, and we'll have to see if any of them can get around Vincenzo Saracino to take the win here. Yeah, and again, we won't want to make it seem like he doesn't have the pace. Like Connor said, they're all within two-tenths of each other. They're all getting really, really close. And Talon Yockel this time, a good exit. If he gets a decent launch down the straight, he could be close enough for a dive bomb. Does he look for it? He thought about it. Saraceno still halfway covered. I think he's almost judging by the sound of the engine, knowing exactly where Talon's going to be. Into the Monza corner, still not able to get by. That one might be a little bit sketchy at a shifter with a shorter braking zone. And then out of there from the rest of the racetrack, Saraceno's kind of able to put this one car length bubble on Yakel, and Yakel can't do much with him. Yeah, definitely. Yakel has been right behind Saraceno for probably six laps now with no way around him. He's definitely got to be getting impatient here, and he hangs a tire right there. You see that's going to hurt him going into the cell tower here. He's got grass on his tires. Vincenzo Saraceno is starting to get a little bit of a gap, and definitely Talon Yakel is starting to get upset with the way that Vincenzo Saraceno is racing. You can tell that he's starting to get anxious and impatient as Annie Rule is starting to get gapped. Maybe her tire pressures are falling off, or maybe she's getting a little bit tired. This is the longest race of the weekend so far. I just, seen, I just saw her miss a couple of apexes in a row, so maybe she's starting to fall off a little bit here as Parker DeLong starting to catch up to her. Yeah, a little bit of fatigue potentially for Annie Rule. Parker DeLong and Calvin Ming are going to eat her up here if she is not able to find more pace and clean up those little mistakes here and there. This time through the turn one section, she looks okay. But as you mentioned, Connor, that gap has opened up. These two have separated themselves by about half a second or more than the rest of the pack they are around. Out of the red 171 corner, it is still Saraceno over Yockel, Rule, DeLong, and Calvin Ming. He's got a second and a half back to Ian Quinn. Then it's Josh Conker, then Zach Frank, Kyle Kennedy. Blake Hunt has had a terrible start to his main event. He's dropped back to 10th, four spots back, and has surrendered the lead in the Group 2 class to conquer. So with this five-car group up front, this is all in the Group 1 KZ category. Hunt that back there at the end of the shot, running behind Kyle Kennedy and Zach Frank, has two drivers out of his group between him and group leader Josh Conker, who's, again, just by himself on his lonesome there in seventh. Yeah, we got two minutes and 50 seconds to go. I'd say there's about three or four or five laps left to go in this race as Vincenzo Saracena crosses the line again. The gap between the leaders, one-tenth. Still, Talon Yockel is right there as he Ooh. sees, trying to make a move to the inside, but Vincenzo Saracino knows that he's going to try. So he blocks. Vincenzo Saracino will not let Talon Yockel through. Talon Yockel cannot be happy about the way that this race is going for him. He's been right there for so many laps and just can't find a way to get around him as this is causing any rule to start to catch back up. Whether or not P Parker DeLong will get there too, we'll have to find out. And Calvin Ming is right there as well. We got the top five. You could throw a blanket over them as they go through the green corner. Yeah, I could almost think here that Saraceno might have had an option on a gear change and be on a slightly uh, shorter gear ratio to run better through the infield and not so good on the long straightaway. Although we see Talon Yonkel overdrive that cell tower corner, hiked the whole front end up uh, on the go-kart, wheelied for a second, was able to gather it up really quickly. He's lost about a cart length in the process. But again, Saraceno pulls a gap all the way through that section, through these 90s here, and then the gap doesn't really go away until the end of the front straightaway. So on this layout, I got to think maybe, especially with that Monza corner breaking up the other long straightaway here in Newcastle, Saraceno opted for a, a gear setting on the motor that would have him with a little more low-end speed and uh, more of an advantage there and give up some of his top speed as a whole. Yeah, you can definitely tell. Uh, Talon Yockel's faster down the straightaways, which that could be a perfect reason as to why. And uh, Vincenzo Saracino uh, still holding up all four of these drivers. 
even Ian Quinn is starting to catch up to them. He was four tenths of a second faster than the leader that last time by. So maybe we may have a six cart train by the time this race hits two to go in just about a minute. So we're going to get this lap and then the next one and then we're going to be two to go. We got about three and a half laps left in this race and Talon Yakel is still right behind Vincenzo Saracino. This is a pretty incredible blocking job by Vincenzo Saracino. Yeah, you want to talk about how uh, pack racing can be for some of the lower horsepower classes. It's very rare you see a pack race in shifter, but Vincenzo Saracino making it happen, leading the way in it. There's obviously got to be a lot of pressure. Saracino has had someone on his bumper since pretty much uh, from the time the lights went out across the line. They're going to get three more here. So they're not going to hit the time limit this time. They'll hit the time limit next time by a round to get the two-to-go signal. So three laps to go currently. Saracino, as you can see on screen, just a little bit narrow in those high-speed sections to kind of keep that thought out of mind. Meanwhile, Parker DeLong has worked his way up to fourth. He's gone by Calvin Ming. So Parker DeLong in one spot higher to the podium, and he could easily get up there. So, you, you know, we weren't sure where everyone was going to kind of shake out Parker DeLong has found himself ahead of Ming, closing in on any rule, and he's almost there now. Yeah, Parker DeLong has been really impressive here this race. He's been running in that fourth or fifth position about the, the whole race, and uh, Andy Rule is also caught up to Talon Yockel. Um, every corner, the gap fluctuates, but they are all right there, and they're right behind Vincenzo Saracino as they go through the blue corner and onto the back straightaway. This is going to be two to go this time by. Three corners left until we get the double sticks. Vincenzo Saracino has been perfect this whole race. Has, hasn't been the fastest, but he's been able to hold everyone back behind him. As they come across the line here, Vincenzo Sino sees the sticks in the air. He's gonna, definitely going to have to block it right here, and you can see he's going to, and there he goes to the bottom. Talon Yakel trying to find a way around him, but he just can't get around him as he looks back to find any rule right in his rearview mirror. I just got to believe your Talon Yakel's cut. Saracino breaks this entire race. When you see someone... Even though he's not doing it, you know, really uh, over egregiously, I think that you could see a little bit of a bump and run attempt on that final lap in turn number one when he knows he's got the chance to get by him because, I mean, they're backing up now, but he has not really had any other chance to get to the lead besides the end of the front straightaway towards the I-70 corner. So knowing he'll have only one more shot in that sector specifically, I think he might be willing to throw it all, lay it all on the line, and put it in the official's hands by putting the bumper to him, putting the chrome horn to Vincenzo Saracino. We're a quarter of a lap away from finding out the white flag will fly this time. Yeah, I definitely think Talon Yakel has been impatient, and that impatience has just been growing as long as this race has been going on. He's been behind Vincenzo Saracino ever since lap two, and we're working on lap number 14. White flag is in the air. One lap to go. Vincenzo looks over his shoulder. He's still right there. He's going to go to the bottom and block once again. Talon Yakel is going to try the outside again. It hasn't worked for him at all, and it won't work for him again. As you can see, Talon Yakel still going to try and go to the outside. No, no moves to be made here. Oh, Calvin Ming to the Ming inside. Ming to the inside on rule. Not going to get it done. He got by Parker DeLong. Now going to get by on rule for third. Two of the smaller drivers in the class. Any rule, and of course the rookie Parker DeLong, maybe, like you said, dealing with a little bit of arm pump, a little fatigue. And the veteran Calvin Ming Gets by both of them here. He's in podium position now. So nicely done by Calvin Ming. Back up front. Saracino defending. Has Yakel beaten away on the bumper there. Door to door for the lead. Yakel's on the outside. Saracino locks it down on the bottom. A quarter of a lap remaining. Yeah, Saracino still keeping him at bay behind. Talon Yuckel takes a look behind. There's no one there. This is his only opportunity if he wants to make a move to try and get the win, or is he just going to settle for second? And out of the final two turns, Saracino, one more corner to go. Yuckel not going to get there. Vincenzo Saracino is king of the castle in Pro Stars. Wow. Yeah, that was quite the job by Vincenzo Saracino to not fold under pressure as he almost... Did it many times. Uh, Talon Yakel kept looking to the inside but couldn't make anything happen there as Talon Yakel is just going to have to settle for a second. He's not going to be happy with that one. Yeah, I mean, he definitely went for it, and I think in his mind he obviously wanted the race clean, and a lot of kudos there to Talon Yakel for wanting to make sure that was a clean fight all the way to the end. He didn't rough him up. He gave him everything that he had, a few love taps here and there, but as a whole, Talon Yakel played that one 
as good as he could. And let's go ahead and see where they all stacked up when the dust settled here in your Pro Stars division. Vincenzo Saraceno, again, your winner in round one of the 2022 Stars Championship Series, the biggest Pro Stars field we have ever seen. A five-cart fight to the end. Saraceno hangs on over Talon Yockel. Calvin Ming ends up in third with a last lap pass to get onto the box. Parker DeLong also gets by Annie Rule in the final stages. He gets to fourth, Rule drops to fifth. Ian Quinn rounds out in sixth, and Josh Conker in seventh ends up as the P1, uh, top finisher out of the Group 2 division. So Conker aboard the Rock Gearbox package holds off uh, Blake Hunt a couple seconds back. So Conker seventh overall, first in class. Kyle Kennedy eighth, Zach Frank ninth, and Blake Hunt rounds the top 10 overall. Pretty much all of your major contenders were on track, finished all the way through. Not a lot of controversy, an edgier seat battle there to the end of will they, won't they? In the end, it was a won't they. Vincenzo Saracino, whole shot, every lap led, and the win, what a performance, Connor. Yeah, that was pretty interesting for sure. I was waiting for Talon Yockel to try and make a move and make something happen there at the end, but he just didn't do it. I'm very shocked to see that, but overall, very clean race. Um, top five were all super close up until the very end there. Parker DeLong ended up fifth. Uh, very solid showing from him uh, for his first shifter race. Actually fourth there with the last oh, yeah, lap. Oh, yeah, he got move around the rule. rule, yeah. Yeah, it was fourth able to get it done. One spot off the box for Parker DeLong. Super impressive. Not bad at all here. Of course, folks, that wraps up our live coverage for King of the Castle for the Stars Championship Series. For Emery Lida, Connor Zillish here in the booth with me. My name is Xander Clements. And the rest of our KC crew team, you can keep watching live coverage as we've still got our live broadcast going down a few hours south of us at the Texas Sprint Racing Series at the Speed Sports Racing Park in Houston. They've got main events coming, including a stacked 40-plus driver KA Senior Division later on this afternoon in about 30 minutes or so. For now, though, that wraps us up here from Newcastle, Indiana. For all of us here from Car Chaser and the Stars Championship Series team, we've got podiums coming, but the live broadcast is over, and we'll see you at the night fight at GoPro Motorplex in one month's time.